You, are you the new editor for What's Good Games? Ghost. He's contemplating his resistance. What's good, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the What's Good Games podcast. You are a source for video game news, commentary, analysis, and funny stuff every Friday. I'm Andrea Renee, joined by Miss Brittany Brombacher. Hello. Hi, Britt. And Miss Christine Steimer is here. Hello. Hello. And once again, we are joined by Miss Rihanna Manuel. Hey. Hey, girl. Hey. Oh, she did, she did like a dance. I know. <laughs> You showing us up. She's like, look how cool I am with my that's what she said pillow in the background. Love Noise. it. <laughs> um, I'm glad that you ladies are here. We're going to talk about some video games this week. Uh, hopefully, we are? I mean, spoilers. We're going to be talking about video games. If you didn't know, now you know. Uh, but we're also going to be talking about what we've been watching because we all know in the quarantine times that we're in, we're all watching a lot more TV and movies than we probably ever have in the history of our lives. <laughs> probably so, than we should. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, that's, you know, up for debate. But that's going to be in the third segment of this week's show. We, of course, are going to be talking about what we've been playing in the second segment as per usual. And we've got some news to get to as well. But before we do that, we want to go over just a few announcements. If you guys missed it, We've been doing a show on Mondays at 11 a.m. at twitch.tv slash what's good games. It is appearing in your podcast RSS feed or at youtube.com slash what's good games as well. It's essentially just like a mini version of the Friday show that you get here where Britt and I kind of recap news from the previous couple of days. We take your questions at what's good game.com slash dear WGG. And some weeks we also do some gameplay streams. If you guys have not yet turned on notifications for our Twitch channel, now would be a great time to do that because we're going to be doing random streams all the time but every Monday for sure at 11 a.m pacific time you can catch us live and good news everybody we're an affiliate now Woo! Yeah! we did it so what does that mean for you well it means that if you have Amazon Prime you get a free sub to Twitch and we would kindly request if you haven't given it to somebody else already maybe you could give it to us that would be really swell plus we've got emotes you guys i've got the first emote it's the that's what she said pillow it looks great i'm working on a second emo of brit's face and i'm really happy with what i've workshopped so far <laughs> Nice. So is I, it the wine reaction face? Because I feel like that's a classic. Um, oh. That is a good one. No, so she took some custom photos for me. And I showed them um, to John because I was editing them. And he came out and he was like, what are these photos? <laughs> <laughs> and I was it's like. It's your secret kink pile. <laughs> <laughs> the spank bank material i knew there was someone out there for me all along <laughs> <laughs> and he was like is she like in pain i go no that's her joyous face <laughs> I they know, are I, one and the same for Brittany. oh i was like oh god so i was sitting here like by myself in this room and i'm just making all these uh, faces and like clicking the you know the, the camera take photo and then i'm looking at them after and i'm like oh this is terrible and i felt like 1% bad sending them to you because all five of them look like I'm constipated or like something is really bad is happening. But I guess that's just the way it you goes. You do it for us, Brittany, and we appreciate that about you. Oh, yeah. It was, yeah, thanks. I think I pulled every muscle in my neck possible, but it's fine. Those are some weird faces I make. And if you do, and if I don't, and I'm going to force them, if I force them, it, it, it's not great. <laughs> yeah. But are we talking about it. faces at this point? Yeah, <laughs> you know, that, that took a turn. <laughs> whatever floats your boat. You, we could be talking about whatever is making you feel good because right now we're all under quite a bit of stress. And hopefully if you guys are needing a release or some laughter, Brittany's amazing face can give it to you. Oh, boy. That is what she said, ladies that and gentlemen. Oh, but um, bing. Where's the but symbol when I need it? Um, but thank you to everybody who has uh, given us their subscription. We really do appreciate it. We're going to be working on more stuff on our Twitch channel. So hopefully if you guys are into live streaming or watching us live stream, we can see you over there and we'll see you in chat. Also, you may have heard us talk a little while back about being involved with a really top secret Patreon project. Well, that project is now live. It's a cool little film that Patreon put together at a website 
called creativityovereverything.com. And essentially what it does is it emphasizes the struggles that creators have to go through in order to get their creations into the hands of their fans. And there's all kinds of creators that are featured, artists, musicians, cosplayers, and us here at What's Good Games, um, because Patreon does have quite an assortment of different types of creators on the platform. And so a big thank you to Patreon for including us in that. If you guys want to take a look at it, uh, again, creativityovereverything.com is the website address. And um, I wanted to just take a moment to give a special thank you and shout out to all of the healthcare workers who listen to What's Good Games. We want to give you uh, the biggest props we can possibly give you since you are on the front lines of what's happening in this global pandemic. We got an email from a guy named Michael, who's an RN at the Denver hospice, saying that the podcast really helps him get through some of the tough stuff that he's going to going through. And we've gotten some other messages from healthcare workers as well. So we just wanted to give you guys a little shout out and thank you for doing the work that the rest of us would like to do, but are woefully unqualified to do. So thank you for being qualified, willing, and courageous. We love you guys. You're the best. You're here. Um, and now, Brittany, do you have any other announcements you would like to include? Um, I think I would like to say, if you are listening to this on Friday, you should go to twitch.tv slash what's good games and watch the stream archive of Andrea playing Resident Evil 3. It's going <laughs> to... I forgot about that. I forgot oh, I did yeah. that. Oh, it's going to be it's great. Been long, I am so it's excited. been a long week. <laughs> it's going to be fantastic. She's going to play it. It's going to be available for you now. And look at big, brave girl Andrea playing zombie video games very proud of her just so everyone's clear i definitely am playing on the most baby ass baby mode that i can get it on so we're recording the show before the stream happens so we weren't able to announce that we were streaming in advance because of the embargo restrictions from capcom with the game which was unfortunate but you know it was part of the rules and we follow the rules here at what's good games but yes we did stream some of resident evil am i going to finish streaming it who could say question mark um, depends on how bored you get yes well there's a lot of other things that i think are a little <laughs> bit less face. stressful that i would that i would maybe enjoy playing a little bit more so because it's been the good thing about the good thing about playing it online though is you have you have an audience you're not truly alone that's true right? that's it it kind of worked. That's uh, true. Kinda. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> I, sure. I tried. Why not? I tried. All right. A thank you. Effort. Oh, sorry, Steimer. Didn't mean to cut you off. Um, thank you to this month's Patreon producers, Chewie's Godson, Alex Rogopoulos, Ferris Ate, Mohammed Mohammed, Marcus Brown, Punctified, and Molly Bittner. And welcome to our Patreon community, Emily DeLeo, Jonathan, Sean Smith, Riff Gazamoto, oh. Raphael Vieira Costa, Mitchell Sheifeld, Sheffield, and Josh Earl. Welcome, everybody, to patreon.com slash what's good games. I would also like to give a thank you to our new podcast reviewers. Insert something funny here. Okay, now I know y'all are just doing this on purpose. All right. Um, <laughs> that's really like the name. That's their name, everybody, just so if you were confused. Insert something funny here. And then the next person is get shish bish bish shish. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Nailed it. Thank get you. Get shish bish bish shush. <laughs> Mm -hmm. It's just a mm -hmm. bunch of letters. Yep. Lucas99009, Urban Photography, who left us this very compelling review that says, Beans, beans, a magical fruit. The more you eat, the more you toot. We have. Lovely. The more you toot, the better you feel. Mm. Beans, beans for every meal. Oh, I haven't heard that second part. I haven't of it. heard the second part. What? Yet. Really? <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh, it's a classic. I mean, the first <laughs> half, sure. Yeah. <laughs> we also have Urban. Oh, I already said that one. Theo Marine Akis, Marina, Marina Kit, Marat, uh, oh. M Del 30, Trev 9316, and Muzz 74. Muzz sounds like a very that's dirty a nine, word. That's a nine, my darling. Dear. What did I say? It's 74. Oh, I don't know how that happened. Uh, thank you, Muzz 94. <laughs> anyway, as we say every week, these reviews really help us out in the algorithm and it gets more eyeballs and ear holes on our show. So we really do appreciate those reviews. If you can take a minute every time and leave them, you can leave something like urban photography did and talk about beans and farting. And that's cool. It does the job. Yeah. Tooting. I like that word. Toot. 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 <laughs> <laughs> We're a very mature group here. <laughs> that's good. Oh, speaking of being a mature group, can we just give a shout out to all of the articles that we have seen in the past few weeks that recommend our show to children? 
Yes. Oh. oh. Uh, there was recently <laughs> one. The National Youth Council of Ireland has listed us in an article called Resources for Young People Who Are Staying at Home, and they recommend our show. No. Oh. <laughs> I mean, cool. It's just it's just kind of funny when you see all the shows. We get these a, quite a bit, which is kind of surprising. I mean, I think it's like they're like, females, they must be children friendly. And you're like, wow. Uh-huh. I don't know. We've Uh-oh. duped them again, everybody. That's <laughs> debatable. Gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's just like a few hours later, we were in another article for teenagers. Yeah, it's a thing. It's cool. Teenagers a little, a little more acceptable than yeah. like children. <laughs> Agreed. Please They're don't deep. let your actual children listen to the show, even though I know that some of you do. Like that's your own cross to bear. <laughs> As a parent, you you are responsible for your children. Ah, uh, we're just happy we can God do it for speed. you. We will have the birds and the beasts chat. We, we and... wait. We will. Wait. That, we will. Is that, I mean, is that now like something we have to do? I, I don't want to take that, that on. <laughs> okay. Oh. Wow. Wow. I just got. Okay. Fine. <laughs> fine. I'm sorry. I can't do this with my three colleagues. No, I'm but Brittany, if you want to volunteer to be the what's good games birds and the bees expert, you, oh, please by all means take the stage. <laughs> I mean, not right now. Let's not clip. Let's not have that. (laughs) Let's not do that conversation right now. All right. Let's get into the news. And this week, the news is brought to you by What's Good Games live on Twitch. We already talked to you about how great Twitch is. Twitch.tv slash What's Good Games. Please go there. Follow us. Turn your notifications on. And if you've got a sub to give, maybe give it to us. And that's all I'm going to say about it. All right. So E3 is a thing that is not happening this year in its normal form. We don't yet know if this digital E3 is actually going to happen. But the closer we get to where E3 was supposed to be, the more it looks like it's not. And something that may be a nail in that coffin is this headline, that Bethesda is skipping their E3 conference, plus they've canceled QuakeCon. So over at Kotaku, they write that Bethesda won't be holding any sort of digital news event in June around when E3 would have been. The company's VP of Marketing, Pete Hines, announced on Twitter today, which would be a couple days ago. Uh, other publishers have mentioned working on alternate plans following the event's cancellation, though nothing firm has been announced yet. And then over at Polygon, they write that QuakeCon, the annual celebration of id Software and Bethesda Softworks, many game franchises has been canceled due to the outbreak of the novel coronavirus known as COVID-19. The fan convention has taken place since 1996, and this would have been its 25th year. In recent weeks, an announcement on Twitter reads, we have spent a lot of time discussing... I'm guessing it's supposed to be discussion, business discussion, how we might still move forward with QuakeCon this year. However, with all of the logistical challenges and uncertainties we currently face due to the COVID-19 pandemic, we have made the difficult decision to cancel this year's QuakeCon. The event was scheduled to take place August 6th through the 9th at the Gaylord Texan Resort and Convention Center in Grapevine, Texas. And unlike other stations in New York, California, and Illinois, the governor of Texas has yet to order a statewide lockdown. Various municipalities are mobilizing as cases of the novel coronavirus have begun to mount. And id Software and Bethesda Softworks have opted to not run the risk of bringing in attendees from around the world, even though the event was scheduled to take place in the summer. Quote, while we don't know what the state of the pandemic will be this August, QuakeCon continued, we do know that it will not be possible to complete the work and planning with partners, vendors, volunteers, and others that is required to make QuakeCon a success. So this is not surprising. Um, but before we get into discussion about it, Britt, we have a we have a question from a patron. We do, because if you are a patron at patreon.com slash games every Wednesday afternoon, I make a post there, I ask for questions, and you can be like Ian Sharp and ask us a question and get, get it right on the show. It's great. Ian's question is, with Bethesda skipping E3 and instead releasing information about games individually, does that help game creators better manage crunch if they don't have a fixed conference deadline to meet? I mean, short answer, yes. Like, that definitely does help. I do think also it's smart for them to skip E3 because with you know a lot of studios moving to work from home people's output is not the same and it's much more difficult to work together remotely um, especially on like a software team like that it's obviously possible it is not impossible but it does usually mean a little bit slower rate of completion and especially at the beginning especially while there's a pandemic going on people are stressed this is not the time to be forcing people to create something under a deadline like E3 in my opinion. No, I'm, I'm with you that it is possible, but stressful. And I think, you know, when you look specifically at QuakeCon, you don't want to celebrate your 25th year 
under everything that everybody's been dealing with and, you know, the idea that you would make it probably like a little bit bigger of a celebration than QuakeCon is normally because of it being 25 years and all of that. So I understand, you know, Bethesda's reasoning behind canceling it, especially since a lot of, there's still like a lot of uncertainty about what's going to happen. And, you know, it feels like we keep getting different information with each 24 hours that passes. It's like, oh, there's something new and the, the strategy's changing. And so I get that uncertainty. I also think that Bethesda usually keeps their cards pretty close to the chest about what they're going to be announcing at their E3 conferences. We usually have visibility about like one title and we can hypothesize about a couple others. And I think a lot of us were hoping that we were going to get a first look at Elder Scrolls six at this year's E3, even if it was a tease, but we do know that that game is also not going to be ready for this year at the very least, I would say probably 2021 at the earliest, but, um, I do, I was hoping maybe we'd hear more about Starfield, but I think that maybe Bethesda will do that as a separate standalone event at some point in the future. Maybe GDC Summer, who knows? As a fun throwback, I have our Bethesda E3 2019 predictions in front of me. Ooh. Mm -hmm. And it's thanks to their magic eight ball. One of them was, will Pete Hines say, we fucked up on stage, better not (laughs) tell you now. (laughs) Will BJ say, daddy's home and Wolfenstein 3 be revealed, cannot predict now. Will we get a release date for Doom Eternal, which is kind of funny. My sources say, no, will they announce Prey 2? Will we get another Evil Within game reveal? So it's kind of fun to look back on those, and that's what we were looking for, right, at last year's Bethesda E3 press conference. And, well, I think we kind of flunked all of those. <laughs> well, the yeah, Magic 8 Ball failed us. That's true. It's not our fault at all. As, you know, people <laughs> in this industry, it was the Magic 8 Ball's fault. Mm-hmm, oh, man, mm-hmm. what are we going to do pa- for our book. E3 prediction show? I mean, if there's no E3. I know, Rip. but it, it's like a really fun thing. It's so sad. I mean, I mean we everything just... will be later. I think that's the, the main prediction. <laughs> Hopefully, or... event, events get announced, streams, then we can take those and do our little, our usual thing with it. But it's, yeah. it's not going to be the same. Whenever we get a new trailer or a something, we will now sit with the Magic Gate Ball okay. and we will ask it questions about that piece of content. That's it. It'll, it's just going to be a much more fragmented <laughs> magic. It'll be a scattering. Like someone smashed the magic eight ball. And now there are pieces of it all around on the show instead of being one show. Hmm. That sounds tragic for the eight ball to get smashed. I know yeah. it's a, it's a metaphor. We're not actually smashing. Oh. Uh, <laughs> have you ever seen what's inside of a magic eight ball liquid? You probably shouldn't drink. That sounds right. I was going to say something like <laughs> magic fairy dust, unicorn tears. And so I'm just like fucking facts dropping now. Liquid, you shouldn't drink. <laughs> Liquid with chemicals in it. Don't drink it, kids. Mm-hmm. Um, all right. Well, I guess we'll keep our eyes peeled if Bethesda will do something potentially later in the summer or the fall. We do know that Gamescom is still happening. Speaking of which, the next story comes via IGN. Um, this is not the actual headline of this article. I'm realizing I need to open this article up and read the actual headline. Gamescom will go ahead, at least in a digital format. So this story says that millions, so there was a statement made, I should say. Millions of fans worldwide are excited about Gamescom 2020, said the game managing director Felix Falk in a statement. This is why we are determined to celebrate the latest news announcements and world premieres together with the community again this year at the end of August. In the view of the corona crisis, we are now expanding all digital formats at full speed so that Gamescom 2020 can at least take place digitally in any case. Falk said that fans can expect opening night live in the Gamescom Now portal to return to the event as they determine how to expand its digital strategy. Gamescom will still take place from August 25th through August 29th with the DevCom developer conference still set for August 22nd through the 24th. However, according to the article, they are going to reassess Oh, yes. A mid-May evaluation will take place to determine how Gamescom can move forward with its usual Cologne-based presence, if at all. So they said in a quote here, if an on-site event is possible, there will also be more information at that state with regard to what changes need to be made in order to fully ensure the health of all visitors. This has been arranged with the latest, excuse me, with the largest exhibitors. Therefore, all Gamescom plans are continuing at full speed. So... 
that's mm-hmm. interesting to hear because Gamescom is by headcount the largest gaming convention in the world. And I don't know if y'all have seen the videos of what Gamescom looks like when they open the doors, but it is terrifying. I have been to Gamescom. Yeah. Have you I ever been don't... in that lineup where they where it's Hell like the running no. of the bulls <laughs> to get in? <laughs> no, I worked it, so I had my own entrance. <laughs> smart <laughs> i mean not really smart they made us work 12 hours a day but it was <laughs> that's terrible it was fine everything's fine drinking your <laughs> coffee the room's on fire <clears throat> speaking of shenanigans that have been changed rtx just announced that they postponed their event from fourth of july weekend to september 5th through 7th i believe i don't it's have the labor day weekend yeah labor yes. day weekend which is Usually the same, same weekend as, as PAX West. PAX West, yeah. Yep. Yeah. So and also PAX West. Dragon Con. Yes. Dragon Con Dragon is Con. also that yeah. weekend. Uh, mm-hmm. So if if things can happen, then I guess they're all gonna happen at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> Seems like. Yeah, it's it's a bummer that they had to move RTX because we had planned to go to RTX this year. We are working with our partners at Rooster Teeth to figure out if there is a way for us to still be part of RTX, given that it is over PAX weekend. Now, to be clear, Reed Pop has not officially announced the dates for PAX West, but historically, PAX West has always been over Labor Day weekend, so there's no reason for us to anticipate it not being over Labor Day weekend this year. But I imagine the reason why Reed Pop has not announced it is that they want to have a little bit of flexibility in case things change or shift over the next couple of weeks and they want to be able to delay or move dates and that way they don't have to worry about people making travel arrangements and rearranging everything, which is smart of them. But, you know, I don't I don't anticipate at the moment PAX canceling because if you think about it, it's the only show now in North America that's really going to take place in the window that is really prime marketing for video games ahead of the holiday, especially with the two new consoles still supposedly on track. We got, you know, confirmations, which Brooke and I talked about on the Monday show from both Sony and Xbox that the neither of the consoles are delayed. And so PAX West is going to become an even more important show with the absence of E3 than it has been probably literally any other year that PAX West has been running. So it's it's a bummer for sure, but I'm, we're obviously glad that the team at Rooster Teeth is taking precautions and making sure to keep people safe, their staff safe, um, all of the creators, and of course all the fans that attend. So um, more on that in the in the coming weeks and months, but um, but yeah, kind of a bummer. Crazy. Bit of a bummer. Yeah. But I mean, everything has to happen eventually. So there's things that are going to end up overlapping and it can't really be avoided. There's only so many weekends left in the rest of the year once we're able to fly around the country again. So you just got to choose your battles at this point. So weird. It's just so weird to think about. I feel like this new year just started at the same time. I feel like it's been going on for 10 years by itself. (laughs) The month of March has been the longest month. (laughs) March was like 150 days. Yeah. Not sure how that happened, but it did happen. Well, do you ladies want to talk about some Call of Duty? Woo! Yeah, sure. Let's do it, Britt. Oh, hey, Take it away, it. Britt. Okay, so Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2 Remastered Campaign is out now. Woo! This comes from Via Polygon. After a brief leak on Monday morning, the remastered version of Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2's campaign is official. Activision announced the remaster on Tuesday, which will be released first on PlayStation 4. The remastered campaign features, quote, high-definition visuals up to 4K resolution and HDR support on console. Activision's Activision said in a news release, and an uncapped frame rate and ultra-wide monitor support on PC. The original Modern Warfare 2 had 18 missions, including the infamous and skippable No Russian Mission, which tasked players with moving through an airport as civilians are killed by terrorists. You could participate in the killing or not. The game does not include Modern Warfare 2's multiplayer or Spec Ops mode. Modern Warfare 2's campaign remaster also comes with the underwater demo team classic Ghost Bundle. This bundle of content for Call of Duty Modern Warfare and Call of Duty... Warzone includes the new UDT operator skin for Ghost, two new weapon blueprints, a new weapon charm, a new finishing move, a new voice quip, a new player card, and emblem. The remastered version of the Modern Warfare 2 campaign is available for purchase now on PlayStation 4 and can be pre-purchased on Xbox One and Windows PC through the Blizzard clients. So we have a question from patreon.com slash what's good games from one Josh Games. 
I almost said Gomez. <laughs> I was like, yeah, it's probably games. You're probably being cute and cheeky. <laughs> Says, what's good, ladies? With the news of the new Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2 remastered being seemingly shadow dropped on PS4 and Xbox and PC later, this begs the question, how are people going to react to the infamous No Russian mission? Not to be one of those guys, but I'm genuinely curious to see slash hear how people are going to take to that being dropped into the current world climate, especially with how the reaction to the white phosphorus being a perk. Sorry, I don't know the actual bro shooter terms in the most recent game. Am I overreacting here, or is there the potential for a massive amount of completely enforced social media outrage on deck? Um, that's an interesting question, Josh. I honestly don't think it's going to be as big of a deal right now because people's minds are elsewhere. I think when people have time to be mad about trivial things, they shout their anger about trivial things. And I think we've talked about that on the show before about how frustrating it is that people get so worked up over things because their lives must be so good that they need to find something to be angry about. And it's these little things because otherwise they would be dealing with the bigger bullshit that's in their life. And right now, a lot of us, in fact, the vast majority of us have bigger bullshit happening in our lives because of what's happening around the world. And so I honestly think that this is probably going to fly under the radar and people aren't going to make a stink about it because people made the stink about it back when it came out. And people have made stinks about it, you know, after the fact. But given what's happening in the world, I would say I would say no. I think the thing that people did get upset about, which was kind of a head scratcher, is why PlayStation didn't get out ahead of this with messaging to say mm -hmm. that this was going to be part of their exclusive um, DLC drop system that they have with Call of Duty. So we know that Call of Duty and PlayStation or Call of Duty, uh, excuse me, Activision and PlayStation have had a, par a marketing partnership for quite some time now and that they've gotten 30 days exclusive access to multiplayer maps and a variety of other things. I wouldn't have imagined that the entire campaign as DLC would have been part of that deal, but apparently it was. And so, and they didn't really tell people that. And we do know from experience that gamers tend to get really upset when you don't message things properly. Mm -hmm. I thought we were the most logical group of people on the planet. <laughs> what are you talking about, Andrea? Uh, speaking about Sony exclusivity, worth noting that Call of Duty, will Sony is not releasing Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2 in Russia. It's coming still, though, to Xbox and PC, but they said, nay, we are not opening that can of worms. We're going to leave that to Xbox and PC. Interesting. That is a, that's mm -hmm. a weird choice. I so wonder, the, I wonder the why. Tweet, the official tweet from Call of Duty Russia, which is Call of Duty RU, uh, says, Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2 campaign remastered, this is translated, is a completely fictional 2009 campaign recreated in HD quality. Sony has decided not to sell the game in Russia PS Store. We look forward to the release of the game in digital form for PC and Battle.net and Xbox consoles. Uh, you know, probably because they just, they know that the Russians probably aren't a very big fan of that game. Or at least the Russian higher-ups. The brass, if you will. So they don't want to piss people off. Uh, yeah. That's just my little guess. That's fair. The interesting thing about the no Russian mission, at least from the original Modern Warfare 2, which I played through, is that you have the option to play the mission, you have the option to shoot civilians, or you have the option to do absolutely nothing. And it's interesting that in this climate, obviously, many years later, the world is completely different, that they haven't really given a lot of detail about what your options will be now. Because mm -hmm. I think that does change the way it hits. Like, it, it hits different if you can't choose to go completely passive on that mission. So it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. Yeah, and also... I assume it would be the same. I would find it really odd if they took that away from you. Yeah, it would be odd. I hope they... We'll see how it goes. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure we would have, because this was... We covered this on the Monday show as well, well, back when it was still, you know, rumored to stealth launch on Tuesday, and then it actually launched today on Wednesday. But, um, yeah, you know, it's it, also this was in 2009 and I feel like that well, that was 11 years ago. Holy shit. The uh, games have, I think, pushed the boundaries wow. to you so much further. I know. Right. That Isn't just that... broke my brain a little bit. Uh, in my I head, know. I was thinking 2019 for some reason. I don't know why. Like brain was like, oh, it wasn't that long ago. Yeah. No, that was, you know, 11 years ago. And I think games have kind of Miles. come a long way and they tackle more mature themes. And I mean, I don't, I'm not saying they've tackled more mature, more mature themes than that of a terrorist attack in an airport, but, you know, they continue to push the envelope. And, yeah, I don't think anyone's really going to make a stink about this one. 
you know, know, the scene still fits narratively and it's meant to make you feel uncomfortable. That's the point. So I don't know. I feel like people have a better context for it nowadays. And I feel like I just got my Modern Warfare 2. What was that Elite Edition, the Collector's Edition, where you got the night vision goggles? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) That was me. I was out in my parents' yard stealthing around looking at raccoons and shit. Oh, man. Oh, my God. I can (laughs) definitely see that. I totally did. Those were the days. Barely 21. Oh, yeah. Let's go. I, yeah. Nope. I have nothing better to add to that. Nope. (laughs) (laughs) You didn't stealth the you know, sneak on raccoons wearing night vision goggles, Andrea, back in, well, you weren't here. You weren't, where were you in 2009? You were in Fiargo. I was in Los Angeles. <laughs> yeah, okay, so Fiargo. never mind. You, you wouldn't have been. I was bartending, trying to make rent in a post-Great Recession world. Oh, you know. Feeling sorry Everyone. for myself. Let's not go back to 2009. Anyway, next story. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Epic Games offers $1 million reward for evidence of house party smear campaign. Steimer, you want to read this one? That depends. Because <laughs> right now I'm getting echo in my ears. Okay, Rihanna, I'm pitching it to you. You got this. I got it. I got it. So from IGN, we have um, Epic Games is offering $1 million reward to the first person who can prove that a commercial smear campaign targeted at House Party, a social network Epic owns, has been put together. So House Party is a face-to-face social network that allows users to group video chat and play games together. And Epic Games has purchased House Party as of last year. So originally, this was reported by the BBC, and House Party believes it's under attack by a, quote, paid commercial smear campaign, end quote, meant to harm the company. Um, so this House party. Yeah, so this was Sorry, a tweet ahead. that this was a tweet that House Party made that was in the middle of the story, just so you're aware of what this italics right. is. Got it. Okay. So House Party tweets, "We are investigating indications that the recent hacking rumors were spread by a paid commercial smear campaign to harm House Party. We are offering 1 million dollar bounty for the first individual to provide proof of such a campaign." To bounty at houseparty.com. Sorry, I'm giggling because Brittany keeps doing the Dr. Evil pinky. (laughs) I'm giggling because this is a ridiculous story. I know. (laughs) I'm trying to give it the the, the gravitas it deserves. Okay. (laughs) This bounty for evidence comes after a slew of online rumors that allege the House Party app exposes vulnerabilities to personal information found on other services like Netflix and Spotify. Uh, BBC reported that several Twitter users posted screenshots claiming to show that after downloading the House Party app, they were locked out of things like Netflix, Spotify, and personal bank accounts. Quote, we found no evidence to suggest a link between House Party and the compromises of other unrelated accounts, end quote. And that's from an Epic Games person, sorry, Epic Games spokesperson when they were talking to the BBC. Quote, As a general rule, we suggest all users choose strong passwords when creating online accounts on any platforms, end quote. Good advice. (laughs) House Party's popularity has risen with the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, rising from an average of 130,000 downloads in a week in February to 2 million in a week in March, according to BBC. Ha! That's interesting. I do love that their spokesperson quote is basically like, Hi, user error. If anything, if anything happened to you, it's because you fucked it up. <laughs> like, that's <laughs> what this says. <laughs> I love, though, the reason I pulled this story and added it to the show notes is because there are a vocal minority of very loud people who are adamant and insistent that Epic Games is shady and doing these things and that now anybody associated with Epic Games is shady and doing these things. And so I love that Epic is like, oh, yeah, we'll give you a million fucking dollars if you can prove it. Put your money where your mouth is. You think you're a cool internet commenter posting in your forums complaining about how bad of a company we are? We'll give you a million fucking dollars. (laughs) I love it. I love it. (laughs) I know. Speaking of Epic Games, we didn't touch the touch on this during our Monday show, but they recently announced a publishing deal with Remedy and Play Dead. Oh, yes. I believe there was one more. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Let me pull that story up. Okay. So 
So as she's pulling that up, this is kind of the lowdown of how that whole deal is going to work out. And they shouted this from the rooftops, which I think is really cool to get an inside look of how the deal is structured. So the developers will have full creative control of their games. Developers retain 100% of all IP. Epic Games Publishing will cover up to 100% of <laughs> development costs from developer salaries to go-to market expenses such as QA, localization, marketing, and all publishing costs. Once costs are recouped, de developers earn at least 50% of all profits. And so Remedy announced that they are working on two unannounced games and that Epic is essentially funding all of, like every bit of it, which I think is really neat. So to kind of put this in perspective, I pulled an article here. While you are um, going to say that, so the, yeah. the three devs were um, uh, Gen Design, who mm -hmm. made The Last Guardian, Play Dead, known for Inside and Limbo, and then as you mentioned, Remedy, which of course made you know one of the best games of the year last year, Control. Okay, so yeah, talking about Control, here's the thing I want to read. So another publisher's deal with Remedy makes for an excellent comparison with Epic. For investing $7.75 million into Remedy's development of Control, which costs between $20 and $30 million to make, and handling market and distribution, 505 Games secured publishing rights for 20 years. For that 20-year period, Remedy gets 45% of Control's net revenue, which refers to revenue after the investment is recouped, retail costs, marketing costs, and so on. Practically, this means that if Remedy's new game flops and Epic never recoups its investment, Remedy won't have lost money because Epic paid for the entire cost of development. The deal with 505 Games didn't even cover half of Remedy's development expenses and took a 5% greater net revenue cut. Epic is bearing more of the risk. Oh, this came from PC Gamer. So, yeah, like that's a really good deal. Yes. Oh, yeah. I think I saw on <laughs> Twitter people lightly. being people people being mad because, of course, they're oh, going to be course. mad. And they were like, it was just like, well, why would you, they're just doing this for the money. And you're like, uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and surprise, surprise. I don't know if you realize this, but video games are a business. <laughs> like, and they cost a lot to make. Like, video games cost so much money to make. Like, yeah. somebody needs to be able to say, like, hey, we need to make money on these things at some point. I like that uh, Epic is using its, you know, Scrooge McDuck bank vaults to pay it forward a little bit with these smaller developers who I mean, not even that you necessarily call Remedy small, but they are an independent dev and like mm -hmm. everybody struggles at times. And so it's it's nice to see that they are reaching out to people that they consider talented, but want to keep supporting uh, or want to make sure like that they can still keep making creations for the world because there's obviously a world in which that doesn't happen because of expenses and not enough sales or there's so many factors when you're running a business and so many different ways you can go bankrupt. So um, I think this is great. GG. Yeah. yeah it's, GG. Good job. Good job, Epic. You guys are great. You're doing good work. And it's cool to see them publicly talking about this. And essentially, you know, it's this is what they're doing. And if you're not living up to these standards, granted, like, not everyone can do what Epic's doing. Like, Steimer said, huge fucking Scrooge McDuck pile over there. But yeah, <laughs> I mean, looking at you, Steam, where you at? Yeah. Steam is Daddy Warbucks, so they're keeping all that shit to themselves. <laughs> yeah, no, right? They're hoarding it. They're like that dragon you guys like from Lord of the Rings so much. Smog. Smog. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. He's on his dragon pile of money. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't need to reiterate. You guys know how I feel about it. I think I think Epic is great. I think the way they support devs is great. I think the way they support their team is great. The way that they support their the families that support their teams are great. And, like, if you have it in your mind that you're convinced that Epic is evil for some reason, I don't know how to convince you. I know lots of people that work for Epic Games, and I've met lots of developers who have taken publishing deals from Epic Games that said, like, our studio would not be able to make this game without the support of Epic. And so I think that they're doing really positive things for the industry, and I'm not going to say it again. I mean, I probably will well, say it again. I, probably I mean, will. <laughs> they've, got a, they've got a paid commercial smear campaign going around. <laughs> so like, that's so funny. <laughs> <laughs> oh all right um steimer i feel like you should read this next one so Brittany can can express her, her feelings about the, it. the <laughs> speech jammer effect has gone away so i may speak now uh, people are already playing final fantasy 7 remake in australia Brittany, face please oh, oh. she's oh. flipping the bird <laughs> just a slow middle finger rising from the depths all right uh, this is via kotaku so when square enix announced physical copies of final fantasy 7 remake would ship to europe and australia earlier than its april 10th release date due to the covid 19 pandemic we didn't think they meant this early 
The eagerly anticipated game is already in the hands of many Australians, as evidenced by a growing number of Twitch streams and YouTube videos. <laughs> Quote, love living in Aust right now, reads <laughs> the title of one of the numerous <laughs> Final Fantasy VII Remake live streams on Twitch this morning, uh, nine days earlier than the official release date. What was supposed to be a global release on April 10th has turned into a strange, staggered release due to the complications brought on by, COVID, by the COVID-19 crisis. More than 30 streamers are broadcasting the adventures of Gussied Up Cloud and friends <laughs> in Remake Midgar, <laughs> and that number is only going to grow. Ugh. Note that the early uh, release only covers physical versions of the game. Ironically. The Australian PlayStation <laughs> Store still lists digital versions of Final Fantasy VII Remake for the April 10th release. That's just the shit, too, is that they are digging the people who are buying digital, even though the profits that Square makes on the digital are greater because they don't have to bear the burden of the cost of physical. It's crazy to me that now that the game is out in Australia that they haven't just lifted the digital release worldwide. And we talked about this on the Monday show and about what that would mean and what the implications would be for everybody who bought retail or pre-ordered at retail. And I think in, I think the discussion that Britt and I had was, I think a make good that Square could do to kind of make everybody feel better about it is say, you know what, did you buy it at digital? We're going to give you, uh, or did you buy it at retail? We're going to give you a digital code right now and you can get access if you have the receipt like if you have like the paid in full receipt not just a pre-order five dollars down at GameStop like the full like sixty dollars like I'm waiting for my copy receipt then we'll give you a digital code and we'll give everybody access like that's like that's what they should do like nine days early is a lot we don't even have codes from Square Enix yet for the game <laughs> um as of shooting the show on Wednesday and so when we see people playing, we get we get your frustration. It's it sucks. And I feel I think like what they got to do now is just be like, yo, yo, the world's on fire right now. How about we just have a kumbaya moment where we say, you know what, let's just release it early. Just do it. Yeah, You know, part of me, I want to be angry. But right now there's a lot of shit going on. So if Final Fantasy seven is helping to find people of Australia and listen, they get the shaft all the time. They with video do. Games. Oh, Australia yeah, they gets really like the worst of it. So you know what? You go on with your bad self. I'm not gonna lie. I'm a, I'm obviously a little a little jealous. Just just an insy bit jealous. But I'm also very happy for all those people and their kangaroos. We also have a Patreon question from Mitch Crasson. Uh. It says, do embargoes ever change based off of extenuating circumstances? Yes. Final Fantasy VII <laughs> is out in some countries, yet the embargo hasn't lifted yet. Or is it a case of don't break it just to be safe? Yes. I mean, you do not break embargo Never. even if the thing is out. No, mm -hmm. don't. Yeah, but it's not uncommon. I mean, it doesn't happen that often, but, you know, you will get emails from PR saying, like, okay, actually, due to this, that, and the other, um, go ahead and feel free to talk about this. Or on the flip side, something will leak before it's not supposed to, or someone will break embargo, and you get that email from PR saying, like, just because this has been posted does not mean you can do the same thing. It's right. It's kind of like a dancing game. Yeah. yeah, it depends on the t on the team and on what exactly has happened. In this case, I wouldn't be surprised if, like, again, as Andrea said, we don't have anything right now. So even if an embargo lifted, we would have nothing to say. Uh, but if there, if that was not the case and we did, um, it would be something where we would still have to go through and like email the PR team and be like, hey, we know this is out here. Has that changed embargo? Has that not changed embargo? And then they usually respond and say yes or no, and then you go from there. Yeah. yeah, my experience um, with embargoes changing has been for the most part, they say no because they usually go and do like takedowns, like cease and desist with people who get it early. But generally, if they do change their mind, it's because a critical mass of people have done it and they just their legal team just can't keep up with the takedowns. And then they're like, this is futile. Let's just let's just let everybody post. But there's been multiple times where somebody has accidentally broken a bargo because they post, they scheduled something to post and like their CMS posted it accidentally from some kind of technical glitch or human error because they picked the wrong time zone and then it went live early or whatever. Uh, and then they have said, oh, well, you know, it's fine. Just go ahead. Everybody post. And that's frustrating, honestly, as somebody who covers games, because particularly with video coverage, I can remember multiple times where they moved a video embargo and the editing of the video just wasn't ready. And then all of these other people who have bigger staffs or who have a dedicated department to do editing were able to kind of get their coverage up immediately or hit it live right away. 
And then at some of the outlets that I worked at, we just couldn't compete. And then every hour that you're behind kind of drops you in the SEO rankings. And it's it's really frustrating when that stuff happens. But they knew this was coming. They announced that they were going to be shipping early. Like they knew in advance they could have made a different strategy, but they didn't. So Yeah, it, it's weird. I feel like with Final Fantasy VII, one of the most anticipated games for how long now, it's weird that it's a staggered, re- like it almost feels like it's a staggered release. It feels like, you know, waiting for that embargo to break and looking at all the review scores pour in. There's that kind of like magic about that that's really exciting or maybe that's just, you know, something I get off on, get off on personally. But, you know, I don't think, like the article said, when we covered this on Monday, no one really expected this to, for this, you know, street date to get broken with all the brick and mortar stores. But it's happening. So, you know, it, it's it's weird. It's in a weird position because on one hand, something I love about what we do, you know, as people who work in the industry, it's thrilling to play a game and then get to tell the world about it for the first time, right? And this is probably more of a selfish point of view. But I feel like getting able to, being able to do that with Final Fantasy VII is just, it's not really an opportunity anymore because a lot of people are already playing it and people are breaking, you know, and it's fine. This is just like probably a Brit thing, but uh, they are breaking embargo. No, no, they're not. But there's like, no, yeah, exactly. That's just it. Like there's no embargo. So I was obviously like looking forward to gushing to the world about it. But on the flip side, like I was saying earlier, Hey, like, I think this game is going to be really good for a lot of people. I think this is a really beefy, meaty game that will take people to a different alternate universe of Midgar where hopefully they will forget about the shit fire that is happening in our current world. So that's way more important than my selfish little desires that I get off on from now and then. But also speaking about Final Fantasy VII real quick, and this is going to tie into my Resident Evil 3 um, review in the next segment. So the game's over 100 gigs, and one of the reasons for that God is God damn, that- Really? Yeah. It's over 100 gigs? That's what I'm reading, yeah. And one of the reasons is because Square created unique assets for every section of the game. So you're not going to see reused assets, which I think is really fucking cool. And it really turns my crank and flips my switch, if you will. And that's something Resident Evil 3 kind of suffered from. So it's cool to see that they put this much time and effort into that. And that's something that I know I will notice. And I'm sure a lot of people will as well. Just like the little TLC that goes into the details of these games. But... It's so it's gonna it's gonna take so long to download. Oh, yeah. Everybody's throttling so their downloads. <laughs> oh no. They really should allow digital downloads now because it's gonna take the I full know, nine right? days to download it. <laughs> <laughs> Just let us preload, please. Like we gotta we gotta preload this shit. It's not gonna work <laughs> on day one. Oh, uh, Rihanna, are you a Final Fantasy person? I don't think I've ever ever talked about it with you. Because I've never played anything Final Fantasy. High five, girl. High five. Hey. No Final Fantasy f- friends. You're lucky you're an hour north of me. <laughs> <laughs> One of these days it'll happen. Maybe it'll be content. We'll see. However, I have no idea what anything Final Fantasy is. I know Cloud is blonde, and that's about it. I mean, so, that's a good thing to know. That is yeah. something. You know, the good thing about Final Fantasy, and I won't turn this into a whole thing, is typically every game is its own standalone. So you don't have to know much more than general JRPG knowledge is, you know, you have a lot of over the top characters and turn based battles and you know, 15 kind of went away from that sort of kind of, but you got this. I believe in you. If you ever have an inkling, you ever, if it ever sounds good, you let me know and I'll recommend a game. Otherwise, we'll see how long we're in lockdown. I mean, okay, if it gets to I that point, you up. <laughs> <laughs> if it gets to that point. Okay. Fair. <laughs> Um, All right, so we have just a couple more things to round out our news segment in the kind of in case you missed it part of the news. So I put together just a couple more feel-good COVID-19 updates because I know that there seems to be a never-ending supply of really depressing news around it. We have some good stuff happening as well. There was a fundraiser that happened on Twitch that raised over 2.8, or excuse me, almost $2.8 million dollars for the COVID-19 Solidarity Response Fund for the World Health Organization. In total, the COVID-19 Solidarity Response Fund has raised 
Um, oh, sorry, over $116 million from over 200,000 individuals and corporations so far. And the number is growing. So by the time the podcast airs, that number will be even higher. The funds will make sure that health workers around the world have critical supplies like masks and gloves and will also go towards the development of a vaccine. The gaming community has been organizing in really unique ways from bringing together musical artists to hosting streams on Facebook. And the Twitch fundraiser is a perfect example of that um, there's a lot of people covering it we talked about it on the Monday show as well plus Rockstar has announced that it will donate 5% of its online revenue to COVID-19 relief efforts the news was revealed in a post from the Rockstar Games Twitter account where the company explained that from April 1st 5% of in-game purchases in GTA Online and Red Dead Online will go towards COVID-19 relief the donation period will last until the end of May Quote, these funds will be used to help local communities and businesses struggling with the impacts of COVID-19, both directly and by supporting some of the amazing organizations who are on the ground. So uh, that's really exciting to hear. I'm glad that Rockstar is making an effort to donate some of their funds. They are one of the behemoths in the video games industry. So 5% of proceeds from GTA Online will go a long way. And I think that that is awesome. Plus, some other good news. The Outer Worlds is coming to Switch in June. If you have held out and not yet played The Outer Worlds, first off, why? It was one of our top <laughs> picks of 2019. We all loved that game. Um, but I guess you can wait and play it on, in bed on your Switch or on the toilet, wherever you play your Switch. Um, so uh, the private toilet. division Twitter... Yeah, toilet, exactly. The Private Division Twitter account reads, along with Rockstar Games and 2K and Social Point, we're proud to be a part of Take Two support of COVID-19 charities, affected local businesses, and all digital purchases of the Outer Worlds during the months of April and May will help contribute to those in need or excuse me, those who need it most during these times from everyone here at Private Division. We hope our community and everyone else stays safe and healthy. So a little bit of extra good news on top of the fact that the Outer Worlds is coming to Switch. If you do buy it digitally before then on the platforms it's currently out on now, it'll go towards charitable efforts, which is awesome. And we have two new game delays. Wasteland 3 has been delayed to August 28th, and Minecraft Dungeons has been delayed until May 26th. Both delays uh, due to COVID-19 issues and what arises with working from home and whatnot. Unfortunate, but again, the right call. Not a lot more to say about it, but do what you got to do to keep those baby girls and baby boys safe. Yeah. All right, so that's going to do it for our news segment for this week. When we come back, we're going to talk about what we've been playing. And later in the show, we're going to talk about what we've been watching. And you know we're going to be talking about Tiger King. You're going to want to stick around for that. Oh, boy. We'll be back in just a minute. What's good, everybody? Welcome back to the What's Good Games podcast. It's segment two where we talk about what we've been playing. And boy, oh boy, it feels like people are playing a lot of video games these days. And that's a pretty amazing thing. Right, ladies? Oh, that's I, great. I'm on Yakuza 4. <laughs> oh, dang. You are making some progress. I have and I am. And this is going to be the thing I talk about in the next segment. Because to me, I feel like this is a TV show that I've been watching. <laughs> okay. 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 <laughs> um, but before we get into what we've been playing, I want to let you know that this week's hands-on episode, hands-on segment rather, is brought to you by TakeThis.org. So we used to talk a lot about TakeThis.org in the very first year of What's Good Games. They were a fantastic partner for us. And I talked about them last week, and we're all going through some tough stuff. And if you're struggling with your mental health, we're here to remind you that it's okay to not be okay. And our friends at Take This have lots of trained professionals who are fantastic resources if you need somebody to talk to. Maybe if you just want to go to their website at takethis.org and look at some things. Sometimes even just looking at the online resources can make you feel a little bit better about all of the things that are happening in your life. So I just 
wanted to remind everybody that even though we are all feeling a little bit more isolated than we typically do in our day-to-day lives because of everything that's happening, you never are alone. There's always somebody out there for you. And if you need to talk to somebody, they have lots of fantastic resources over at takethis.org. So thanks to our friends at Take This for always being wonderful and reminding us that mental health is important and necessary for your overall well-being. That's all I wanted to say. Um, so, Brittany, turns uh, out there's a video game that everybody's talking about this week. It's called Resident Evil 3. Oh, my God. It's time. It's time, ladies. <laughs> it's time to talk about this. <laughs> oh, I'm not prepared. Okay. I mean, I am, but I'm not mentally. You told me you took notes on Monday. Oh, girl. No, I took literally like six or seven pages of notes. I, I mean, I'm not. It, the fact that I can now talk about it, I, I feel like I'm. I don't know what about to burst. You're not emotionally prepared, I'm, is what you're saying. Thank you, Samer. That's exactly what you, I did. You, yeah, you did the prep work. But now, you know, like, I, and I talked about it a bit on the Monday show. It, it, it was so fresh, and so now I've had some time to think about it and let it ferment in my brain. So let's let's do this. Okay. Have you beaten the game? I've beaten it twice. Oh. Ooh, which is not saying much because it's like a it's like a six to seven hour game. <laughs> uh, that's a significant amount of time to beat that twice. <laughs> oh well that's you know she said. Ah. <laughs> that's what she said ah. uh yeah but also I mean, it gets funnier shouldn't. the longer you think about it <laughs> <laughs> you're right it is um okay so i'm gonna do my brit thing where i just start talking y'all just interrupts me if you're like what the fuck and we'll <laughs> call it good okay so resident evil 3 so this is a remake slash more of a reimagining from the original Resident Evil 1 game from 1999. It is published by Capcom, developed by Capcom, and they also had a partner studio that helped them with this one, which is M2, which is headed by former Platinum CEO, let me get look at his name, Tetsuya Minami. And it's funded by Capcom, but it also remains like a separate studio. So it's worth noting because I'll probably tap into this later. So... For those of you unfamiliar, Resident Evil 3 is a survival horror game. It's much more action forward than Resident Evil 2 was, where Resident Evil 2 was mostly like, oh, you're walking around this police department for a really long time. There's a few outside things. Resident Evil 3 is much more, and a lot of puzzles in RE2. RE3 is much more. Let's shoot a lot of stuff. There are puzzles in this game, but it's not as... It's You can tell the focus definitely wasn't on the puzzles in this one. The puzzles are very simple. They don't really require a lot of brain racking unlike the original re3 and what's attractive about resident evil 3 in theory is that this game takes place in raccoon city and raccoon city um is no longer a thing in future resident evil titles so this was wait hopeful- one second what do, what do you what yeah. do you mean what do you mean well i mean it's like i, I just realized like do i s- spoil what happens at the end of re3 even though it's such an old game yes of course the game is super old Okay, well, I'll I'll tell you what happens at the end of RE3, but I won't spoil go into like specific spoil spoilers about other things during this chat. But yeah, RE3 is uh, RE3 Raccoon City is destroyed, and this is something that I think is alluded to in a lot of uh, future Resident Evil titles. So this isn't necessarily surprising, but this is just me trying to like tiptoe it around. I appreciate you know. your you know inclination to be considerate, but the game is old. Yeah, well, I know, and they true. didn't change. And please correct me if I'm wrong, but they didn't change major story beats the way that like Final Fantasy VII Remake is really doing things a little bit different narratively, correct? Would you say that's an accurate statement or inaccurate? I think you have the beginning, 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 middle, and end. It will be the same. And I think the same goes for Final Fantasy VII. I think what's interesting about these remakes is the guts of the game are dramatically different. So, That's a really gross visual. I know. I said guts, and I'm like, you know, not everyone is as comfortable with the word guts as I am. I probably just <laughs> upset. I kind of liked it. <laughs> Thank you, Ree. Thank you, baby girl. Okay, so the idea of Resident Evil 3 is that it follows Jill Valentine. She is a member of Stars, and she wants to get the hell out of Raccoon City, but she is currently under She's surveillance. Smart. Yeah, right. She's currently under surveillance by um, Umbrella Corporation. And if you're wondering, like, well, who the hell is Jill Valentine and how is this relevant to Resident Evil 2? Because that's the only Resident Evil game I've played. Well, Jill is friends with Chris Redfield, who is, we're going to get a little complicated here, who is Claire's brother. So if you played Resident Evil, so you know who Claire is. She went to Raccoon City to find her brother, Chris. So Jill is friends with Chris. There's some flirtatious and I would dare to say sexual tension between the two of them. Mm-hmm. Jill, mm-hmm. Jill and Leon Kennedy from Resident Evil 2 
theoretically would have worked in the same building together. Star's office is on the second floor of RPD, whereas Leon's desk would have been on the first floor. And this game takes place a day before Resident Evil 2, and it takes place a day after Resident Evil 2. So if you played RE2 and you're like, well, does RE3 have anything for me story-wise? Like, yes, like this definitely fits in the timeline. And so, like I was saying earlier, while this game did release in 1999, and this game has been out for a while, this is much more of a reimagining than I think Resident Evil 2 was. So some of the main story, the main story beats are going to be the same because obviously, like, that's the universe of this game. But how things unfold, um, there's a lot of stuff to be spoiled. So therefore, I'm not going to get into specifics about that because I feel like you should experience that for yourself. So if, let's get into, like, I'm going to, this is, I was telling Andrea, I, I don't know if I've ever had a harder time reviewing a game because when you're such a fan of something and you have such high expectations of a studio like Capcom, it's one thing. And just to review a game that you've never played before or aren't emotionally invested in is another. So I'm going to do my very best to Shane, straddle that line. Yes. Tell me the least favorite thing about this game. Your least favorite thing. Too much shit was cut. Mm. That's my number one thing. And the potential was not fully explored. But I'm gonna start with I'm gonna start with the pros here. So okay, here's the pros. <laughs> I just I'm like oh, start with the negative. oh tell yeah. me the bad news first, and then get into all the good. Is that the only negative you have? Oh no, I have a whole oh, list. Oh okay, okay. Oh, I was I just know. I'm just curious to see like what your breakdown is. Do you want to start with the positive or do you want to end I with the positive? She, she always does. Okay, it's me. I always want to you know. Eh. Okay, so if survival horror isn't your thing, I will say that the assist mode is a mode that's very accessible. Um. From baby like ass a, baby mode. Baby ass baby mode. It's accessible from a from a like aim assist. You know the enemies are a lot weaker. I did two runs, one on ass, one on assist and one on standard. The assist mode, in my personal opinion, is way too easy. Uh, you get way I, by the end of the game. I had so much he healing items and ammo that I'm like I I don't know what to do with all of this shit. And by the end of my standard run, I was really scraping by. So I guess it just kind of depends on what you're looking for. So if you're looking for kind of a breezy experience where you just want to experience the story, do assisted. If you really want to, you know, utilize those survival horror instincts, go with standard. Um, and I also want to give a shout out to Steve Saylor, the blind gamer. Is it Sailor or Sailor? Sailor. Sailor. Sorry, friend. I love you so much. He did a great video on the, like, legitimate accessibility issues you know with being able to like see and read and all that stuff that you should check out his youtube channel and i will link it in the youtube description when i post this video yes, okay, Steve. So pros. he's great so pros uh what this game did well i think what they expanded on was really great and again i'm not going to get into too many nitty-gritty details because that's going to have to go to a spoiler cast which we have to fucking do or i'm just gonna do my own video where i just ramble by myself for probably 35 minutes no you, you know we gotta that. just call our friend jake baldino see what huber is up to we gotta get the three of you on together you can do a spoiler cast i'll help you arrange it okay we'll get great. it done We'll do it. So I think with the existing characters, we have Jill, Carlos, Nikolai, Tyrell. I think they took those characters and really gave them a lot of personality and a lot of oh, oomph, if you will. Jill was a very boring character up until this remake. She didn't have much of a personality. She was very like, oh no, oh, oh, drat. Like she, she didn't have an accent. I don't know what that was. All about. <laughs> I was like, she had an accent? No. Not oh at all. She no. Was, like, that's how boring she was. She didn't even have an accent. <laughs> I had to give her one in my mind. It was a way of me coping. Yeah, like she just wasn't, she wasn't great. Like while she was a badass, she just had no personality. So what's the personality of a wet noodle? I don't know if that's the same, but I'm going to use it. It is. Great. Uh, yeah, so, but in this game, she definitely is a lot more, she definitely has, has an assertive personality. She has the kind of personality I would have assumed she would have had all along. She doesn't take any shit. She's strong. She's an independent woman. She's a badass. She's very, you know, good. Very good. I really like Jill. I think Carl, also what they did with Carlos and their chemistry was great. So, in that regard, Capcom did an awesome job. The voice acting is I have no, nothing negative to say about it. And I think what they did with Raccoon City as a whole, the parts that you do get to see of Raccoon City are, um, you know, they're, it's thrilling as a fan to see the city in a way that I don't think any of us ever thought we'd be able to see because this is the last game in the timeline before it's just blown to bits. So it's kind of like, okay, so what did that look like right before the shit literally hit the fan? Um, like I was saying earlier, a lot has changed in this game. Some of the pivotal moments have changed, the fates of characters, um, you learn how some characters lived, you learn how some characters die, and some characters have completely different outcomes. And that's uh, also very 
interesting. And if you played Resident Evil 2, you're going to appreciate some of the references that you see in this as well. There are some awesome throwbacks to Resident Evil 3, not only with the soundtrack, but also with some dialogue options. And I can't say any more because that would go into spoiler territory. Nemesis is a fucking beast. Stay far away from him. He will rip you a new asshole. As Even on assist mode? Yeah. I mean, it's not as bad. Like, you definitely can take a few more hits from him. But the fact that he can run and he can somehow jump and, like, seemingly te- teleport, which some people have an issue with. But I'm kind of like, well, whatever. It's a video he, game. He, like, night crawlers at you? I don't know what that means, Simon. Oh, shit. Like, uh, right. so night, night yeah, crawlers is it like... Go ahead, Simon. from X-Men, and he can teleport, so uh, it's oh, a blue guy. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, 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 sure. He can, he can nightcrawl Wait, your ass. Brittany, have you never <laughs> seen X-Men? I have, but obviously I didn't any of <laughs> I that. have, period, end of sentence. This is, like, this is the problem with me in movies. Unless it's Clueless or Kung Pao or Rush Hour or Austin Powers, I don't remember anything that happens or The Ring. It's we'll silent. Work on that. They're we judging me. They're totally judging me right now. It's fine. No, I, it's, it, go for it. Just keep, continue your story. Okay. Okay. I'm still going. So it's also very creepy. The atmosphere of this game, my eyes watered on more than one occasion. And what that means is I'm terrified when I get scared, my eyes water. It's a thing no, that happens. Not like a sadness, like a, like a despair. And like, you're really connecting with the loss. <laughs> Uh, no, <laughs> that's, that's a, a different way of looking at it. It's no, it's like a literal, like, I am so freaked out. My eyes are watering. So that's are a good sign. Are you sure sign. you're, it's not because you stare like intensely at the terrifying thing. And so your <laughs> eyes are so wide open that they're watering because they're drying out. That's a very, that's a logical explanation, but no, it's mostly when I was walking through an empty corridor and it was all like the music and the shadows and the creaking. And it's like, oh, this is fucking intense. Mm. Um, and I mean, it looks, it, it runs well. Obviously, in Xbox, there's a few frame issues that I'm assuming are going to be fixed with a patch. Um, and the the issues are mostly zombies, like way off in the distance when they're shuffling around. It kind of looks like they're doing some like robot dance because the frames are like not great. Maybe they are dancing. They could. They could be the secret dancing zombies of Raccoon City. The D virus. The D virus. Yeah. I want to see that mod. Make it happen, somebody. D virus oh mod. Yes, put yeah. the. <laughs> Put the mask on them and make them look like the animatronics. Yeah. Oh, God. Okay. <laughs> um, okay, so, like, again, it's a great survival horror game. It looks great. It, it's an expansion on Resident Evil 3. They do some things really great, like, in terms of character development and, and what they how they took all of that and kind of flipped it on its ass and did something new with it. Cool. I appreciate it. Okay, so, issues. Um, this game, okay, one... I had to cut a lot of my issues down because I can't go into them without spoiling anything, but the ones I can talk about. One is this game could have benefited from an intro. Resident Evil 2 didn't need one because you are Claire and Leon and you are going into this new city, so you're kind of experiencing the story from their perspective. So it's okay if you don't totally understand the backstory or the lore or whatever is happening. But with Resident Evil 2, it opens in a way that I feel like... Three, thank you. It opens in a way that I feel like doesn't... I don't know if it would make a lot of sense if you've never stepped foot into this game before. And it could have greatly benefited from uh, like an introduction, like a recap scene maybe of who Jill is and who some of these characters are that you're going to hear about and or talk about. Or maybe even a prologue that shows you how she got to where she is. Because, you know, she just wakes up in her apartment and she's like, I can't wait to leave Raccoon City. It's like, well, okay, why are you waiting for three days? It's like, why like, why have you been waiting for the... It's a whole thing. Like, I shouldn't say anymore. But it, none of it's explained in a way that makes a lot of sense. And Simon, I was thinking about you a lot. Because I remember when you played Resident Evil 2, you had a lot of issues with the story just not making sense. You're like, why would you do this? What is, I, I mean, I don't remember. I have what, the logic problem where I'm like, yeah. I would, why would you do that? You wouldn't do that. You would do the other thing. It's and like, that's what my problem with horror in general Right. Is you have to really like put on your non-logical hat and like just roll with it. And I have a really hard time doing that. Yeah. No. And I didn't have that issue so much in RE2. Um, maybe that's because I'm just blinded by fangirlism. But in RE3, I definitely had a lot of those issues arise where I'm like, well, the logic in that doesn't make any sense. And not just with the opening, but with certain areas of the game and how certain events unfold, it just really kind of broke the immersion. And I think a lot of that has to do with, I feel like this game was, and I don't know if this was or not, but this is the feeling I get. I feel like it was a little bit rushed and that wouldn't be too surprising. 
because of the stuff that had been cut from it and how you don't get to see as much of the city as I think a lot of us had hoped. I, I tweeted, like, I hope this had been the, what was going to be the ultimate raccoon city romp. And it definitely wasn't that it had a few cool streets that you got to explore and a few, maybe like three or four optional buildings in the entire game that you got to go in and look around. And that was maybe buildings that aren't that exciting. Like there's nothing really cool to discover in there except for a few items. So I think what a lot of us had been hoping for is seeing what they did with Resident Evil 2 that is that they're going to take Resident Evil 3 and really expand on it outside of the characters and and really show a glimpse into Raccoon City. And it, we saw that a little bit, but definitely not to the extent that I had hoped. And I think a lot of people felt the same. And um, like I said earlier, some pivotal moments and some iconic areas and, and boss fights that I think should have been included were not included. And it's not so much of like, okay, well, we're going to take this part out and we're going to add something in its place. It was more of a, well, we're just going to kind of take this part out and just move forward and just skip this entire section or move past this, this or just, you know, speed the story through. Like, let's, let's keep it moving. But it felt like exploration, exploration. Okay, linear, we're sprinting to the end. So it didn't, it just, it just, so, Brittany, so when they were rearranging uh, the guts, they cut out <laughs> some sections of the intestine. You're like, yeah, you're missing like a pancreas or something, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, I, yeah. question for you. Um, yeah. Did you feel that Resident Evil 2 remake cut big sections or had similar cuts that were noticeable? Or is this just unique to Resident Evil 3 remake? I'm, I'm, I'm trying to like take my brain back a, a year to Resident Evil 2, but I don't ever remember having that complaint. I feel like if something was cut from RE2, it was more than made up for. You know, we had the addition of the orphanage, which is a whole new thing. We had the nest or the umbrella lab down, you know, toward the end of that game. And those, while those things more or less existed in the original games, I feel like they were, the orphanage was a brand new thing. But um, I feel like the areas we did get were greatly expanded on, and while a lot of it was kind of like, okay, well, we're going to take this part and we're going to recreate that exactly. It had a certain charm to it that made it feel like it just wasn't, like it wasn't them cutting corners. It was them actually like taking the care and time to recreate it in a way that was meaningful. Um, and yeah, in, in RE3, it just, it just felt like too much was, was cut and we weren't given, we weren't given that, it wasn't given the same sort of, TLC that RE2 was given. Hmm. If I can explain, yeah. It's, I, and again, it's it's, it's hard. Weird. To really, like, why, I, I just keep asking, like, why would they do that? Like, there was no, there was nothing from anybody, at least unless it was like an internal pressure, which you know happens. But it's like it, it felt like it didn't need to happen this year. Like they could have even pushed RE3 remake to fall. They could have pushed RE3 remake to next year. It's like, why this rush to get it out at the sacrifice of, you know, the whole point of remaking something? Yeah, I don't, from what I've heard, development was smooth, that the team was happy with the game. But I guess, like, what does that mean? Like, what were the circumstances? If it was, hey, you don't have a lot of time, like, push this game out. I mean, yeah, it's still like, that's what I'm telling everyone. It's a great game. It's a great survival horror title. And it's a good Resident Evil game. I mean, I would even say, dare I say, great Resident Evil game. It's just knowing the potential that that Capcom has and seeing what they did last year, how they killed it with, you know, Devil May Cry and Resident Evil 2 and Monster Hunter. I think, you know, expectations of that company, they're just high. And that's more or less the reaction I'm also seeing from um, fellow people in the industry is it, it just misses the mark. It's good, but it's not good as RE2 Remake. And... Obviously, RE2 remake is a hard act to follow, but I think it just, they just didn't take the potential that was there. Not to mention in RE3, there are a lot of um, reused assets. And I know on the Monday show, I talked about like the silly plant that I swear is in every freaking level of that game. There's like a single, like, I don't know what kind of plant it is. It looks like a palm plant, but it, it's there. But in RE3, a, you know, pa like, a palm plant? Like, you know, not like a palm tree, but they're like, they're called little palm plants and they have like the little green leaves and. They're like little, I don't know. Like a baby called. palm tree. Yeah, sure. But it's not like the fanning leaves. It's like a, I don't know. I'm not. A, Are you thinking of like a fern? Like a no. cypress? No, no. It has like, it has like the, the pale like stalk with like the cool little ridges and like the fanning leaves. But it's not like a huge like, and it has like eight stalks at once in it. 
I mean, I can't unsee this thing. I can. Hmm. It's a plant. <laughs> draw us a picture. I'll draw. Where's you Microsoft picture. Paint when you need it? I'll do it for you. <laughs> but you know, it's like in every freaking room in the game, and I'm like, that's way too much. Even I'm noticing it. it anyway, so in RE3, you know, there are assets that are reused from RE2, not just plants, but also levels, and that also normally I think would be okay. But in my mind, it's like, well, if this chunk of the game is using RE2 assets, how much did you really create for the new game? Instead of taking something from RE2 and putting conveniently placed trash bags in front of a door, oh, now suddenly you can't go in there. Is that making sense? You know, it, it's, I, I'm trying not to spoil it, but No, anyway. it's okay. I think you don't need to, you know, further explain, you know, your frustration with it. I think we've gotten the idea that it was a little bit lacking in areas that you had expectations that they weren't. And I think that that's a very fair. I think that you look at Resident Evil 2 Remake and how critically acclaimed it was and such an excellent job Capcom did with it. And they set their own bar. And like I said earlier, there was no reason for them to not take the time and the care to do the exact same amount of work for RE3. First off, nobody asked for RE3 Remake. Everybody was just happy to get RE2. I think there was a subset of the community that were you know, secretly hoping that, you know, uh, Capcom would look. A lot of us are asking for the remake, yeah. Um, <laughs> right, but, like, I mean, but when when you ask for a remake, it, uh, another one, after one has done so well, I mean, I think the expectation then has been set, right? That, oh, well, you did it this way. Clearly, the next one's going to be just as good, if not better, right? And mm-hmm. it's, it's a bummer when it's not. I mean, I don't want to, like, compare it to, like, a sophomore album because this is not the same kind of comparison case whatsoever but it just feels like it is like rushed right but like let's not dwell on what you didn't like about it let's dwell on what you did like about it Brittany I already talked about that in the beginning Andrea the happy moment is long gone I I was trying to figure out how we could get back to a happy moment I did that for you Cyber I did that for you so no just to kind of like tie this all up like I'll say it again I think this is a fantastic survival horror game i think you will shit your pants i think nemesis is terrifying it's a very very polished experience minus the one little bug with the frames that i had in on my xbox version i think what they've explored and expanded upon in terms of characters and character development is fantastic i just think just go in this with proper expectations if you are a hardcore resident evil fan you're going to find a lot of things that make you really, really excited and you're going to do the thing where you're sitting by yourself in a big room or maybe this is just me we're like oh shit out loud with no one around you. And you're going to find things where you're like, well, that doesn't make sense. That's disappointing. Is this really the end of it? Um, it is. Okay. Well, for what it was, it was fun, but they could have done this, this, and this, and that better. That's what I'll say about it. Okay. So overall, though, thumbs up? Yeah, of, of course. Like, it, it, I think, again, great game. It's just, you know, it's hard. And this is why I've struggled. I'm such a fan. I know what Capcom can do. I know all the things that were cut and skipped in, in corners and – that's why I think it's it's hard for me. But I think if you aren't if you're you know not if you're not familiar with this franchise, you might not know the difference. I think what you will pick up on though is how it gets pretty linear pretty quick, and you're like, oh, that was weird. Or why are there garbage bags blocking this path? I guess I can't go that way when it's you know you should be able to go that way. But oh no, they didn't build the level in anyway. Well, that's it. So would that's- you say that? To cap it off, you were glad that you played. Oh, of course. Okay. Yeah. Good. Yeah. I think that's all Where's we want. Resident Evil could feed She's me shit on a stick. She's just upset that the guts are a little mangled, more mangled than she wanted them to be. I like the that's mangled fair. guts because it's a fresh perspective. I don't like the guts that were missing. I need mm-hmm. my pancreas. I need my lung, you know? More guts. Yeah. A lung yeah. isn't... Eh. That's important. When I think of guts, I think of digestive tract, not, 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 I, not all internal organs. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's fair. Yeah. I don't know. It's um, a good game. You should play it. It's fun. Just go in with proper expectations is all I would say. Okay. All right. So if you guys want to watch, again, me play some Resident Evil, if you just needed a little bit more convincing about how terrifying this game is, twitch.tv slash what's good games is the place to catch that gameplay. Um, but a game that Rihanna and I have checked out recently, and I'm so glad that you got me back into this game, is the new update for Rainbow Six Siege. So, Rhi, 
Tell me about how you got into Rainbow Six in the first place. Absolutely. So Rainbow Six just recently released, I guess it was like year five of their content. Season yes. Five. Year five um, is what we're happening. Uh, so Operation Void Edge is the name of the new update. Let me just read the little blurb from Ubisoft. Uh, yes. Things are starting to change and Operation Void Edge is sure to throw you for a loop. Two operators as different from each other as they can be. Join Harry's roster and bring them talents that stand at polar opposites. Iana is the brain and technology while Oryx knows the raw power uh, that the human body can carry. Many novelties are coming with this unique season with a rework to the Oregon map and a very special elite set. And uh, let me just quickly uh, talk about those operators. So Iana is an attacker. Uh, her unique ability is the Gemini replicator, where she essentially makes a clone of herself or a hologram. Uh, we'll talk more about that. And then Oryx, who was on the defender side, is just like this super crazy powerful guy that has this like hyper dash. They write, doesn't need any fancy gadgets to hold his own. His body is all the power and utility he needs. Um, oh, so yeah. the Rama, the Remy, Rama dash, I think is what it's called, the, is his signature moves. And it basically allows him to like sprint faster than any other operator in the game. And he can jump up between levels so if you have like an opening in a ceiling he can jump up and pull himself to the second level which is crazy no other operators can do that either so that's kind of exciting he's so like the terminator yeah like he's like physically there's no other operators that can do these things so it's really interesting that they brought this into the mix with how many other operators that they have so uh back to you rihanna yeah so i've been playing some siege recently with some friends and also i got a couple of games in with andrea earlier today and i gotta say these new operators are really breathing new life into the franchise it, it's it's fun to revisit siege in general after playing plunder specifically in call of duty Warzone, because siege really is the whole like i'm gonna set up this encounter i'm waiting for people to attack me i'm going to take them out or vice versa. There's people who are setting up their little encounter. We're going to go penetrate them and we're going to take them over. And that's what she said. Something about it just feels so good to come back to. Um, it's been a while since I played Siege, but I've recently got into some new games over the past weekend and then yesterday and today. And the new operators are perfect for that. Like, I have not personally played um with <laughs> our new Jordanian hero but I've played with Yana and the Gemini drone is really cool like so how it works is you set up a doppelganger of yourself essentially and you send it out it can go anywhere you would go it can climb through windows it can go through doorways and then find people and it gives you a chance to scout out what the defenders are doing and if you're on comms it becomes really really powerful because you can say hey somebody's on the right side they're laying on the ground they're hiding right next to the bomb if you run in there and throw a flash grenade you got it like that that's all you and i don't know something about the team interactions in siege is just different from any other game because you really do have this immediate tactical advantage when you're you're in a full squad and you feel very powerful and in control. And obviously right now, a lot of us aren't feeling very in control because the world is crazy. And it, it's really nice to jump into a game that lets you have all of these different options with these different operators and, and to play your own game and to tailor your experience to the way that you want to um, have it. And I don't know, like earlier today when we were playing, there was even times when Andrea would just jump in with her operator and she was playing Yana at one point and she found somebody and then, after her drone was taken out, she ran in and then actually killed the person. I was like, oh, my God, yes, you did it. Like, she knew everything she needed to know. And it, I don't know. It's, it's something that's just really, really refreshing after playing all of these different types of games, like um, in, in Warzone and even in Animal Crossing, when you're just kind of passively experiencing the gameplay to really take control in Siege. And it's been a while since we've been able to do that. And I'm looking forward to more games. Yeah, that's something I think the player base has really loved about Rainbow Six Siege. And just as like a refresher for people who are like, oh, God, I, re I recognize the name of that game, but I don't know what it is. So it's a 5v5 squad-based tactical shooter, first-person shooter, and it's obviously set in the Tom Clancy universe, and Rainbow Six has been around for a really long time. Uh, the crazy part about the story of Rainbow Six Siege as a game is that 
it has continued to grow year over year. And Ubisoft announced, uh, I believe just last month, that they have hit over 55 million registered players in Rainbow Six, which is crazy, the legs that this game has had. And we're in year five now of, of Rainbow Six. And I agree with you, Brianna. I think that the reason why this game clearly is continuing to be successful is that it scratches that itch of PvP shooters that really feels like you have to have some strategy besides just running around and spray and pray. Now, don't get me wrong. Sometimes it works. There was a couple really sloppy kills that I got when we were playing together. But yo, a W is a W, okay? Um, but I, I love that the team at Ubisoft and the team that's making Rainbow Six has really paid attention to what the community wants, has really you know, committed to investing in the professional esports community around Rainbow Six Siege as well and saying, hey, we have people that really love these characters and want to keep making more of that, uh, which is great. And there's so much more diversity among the operators now than there used to be. Um, they have like operators of all different shapes and sizes now, which is something that you don't really get to see a lot. I love that more publishers are making an effort to be diverse not just in the gameplay style of the characters but also in the physicality and the visual representation of what these operators and characters heroes champions whatever your game of choice is um, and what they look like and because it's a Tom Clancy game obviously it's set you know it looks real and it's set in real world so it was fun because we got to play together and you are so right when you say that it makes such a big difference when you're playing in a crew that communicates on on comms but boy oh boy did I have a very stereotypical experience when I dropped in for my very first match so before oh, we were no. able to party up literally this is my first match back installed this giant patch and I had spent a bunch of time going through some of the operators that I hadn't really played with yet and changing my loadouts you know putting all my skins and my charms on um and then I was like you know what I'm just gonna solo queue into some quick play Oh boy. Why not? Let's just give it a go. What's the worst that could happen? <laughs> First game I get dropped into. Um, somebody, you know, you can see like the, the noise icon come on. Somebody gets on comms and is like, hey, is anybody else on comms? And I'm like, oh gosh, this person is definitely like 10 years old. Oh. Can't, even, can't even tell w w what kind of a person they are. Just know that they're prepubescent. And I was like, okay, cool. Uh, I was like, whatever. I'm just going to stay silent for now. <laughs> and then another person, hey, man, what's going on? I was like, oh, no, there's two of them that are, that are children. <laughs> Why are there children playing? Why are there children playing this game? Um, and then the next thing was, oh, are you a girl? And I was like, no, really? Is that really, oh, like, still happening? Wow. Is that, like, the first thing? And I was really, like, bummed, but also I was like, oh, well, these 10-year-olds clearly just don't know what they're doing wrong. So then I came off mute on my, on my mic, and I said, hey, I'm a girl. You want to talk about it? And then they were like, they were like, oh, there is a girl. See, I told you there was a girl. Then I went back on mute and said nothing for the rest of the match because then they proceeded to, like, have some inside joke about their entrance music and exit music. And, like, they kept saying, it's a virus. It's a virus. And I'm like, is this some, like, teenage, like, meme on TikTok that uh, I don't understand? What does that even mean? I don't know. I don't know. But they kept uh. yelling it, so I had to, like, mute them. And I was just like, oh, God. Oh, right? This sounds is, like, like, the dark like side of Rainbow. Six. <laughs> a lot has changed it sounds like in the online areas yeah no it's it's just interesting because when Brittany and I were at dice earlier this year which feels like a, a lifetime ago um ammunition who was a very popular twitch streamer for rainbow six siege was talking about the work that she did with the ubisoft team who makes this game about why it was important for her to work with them on really overhauling the chat and mute options in group settings because she was like listen like I'm a female player who's really good at a shooter and I get shit for it all the time as any woman who plays in competitive PV games will tell you you get shit online when you're on comms and in a game like Rainbow Six it, like it's helpful even if you're playing with strangers to be have your comms open so you can like help your teammates and a lot of women who play Rainbow Six don't want to because it can be a very toxic place. Rainbow Six has historically had one of the more toxic PvP communities. And it's really disappointing, but I really was happy to hear 
um, her talk about the work that she did as one of the biggest streamers and content creators in the Rainbow Six community to say, hey, like, I want you guys to help build protections for people like me in place who want to play as much of this game as possible because I love this game. This game is amazing. But like maybe allow me to mute individual people in my squad instead of either muting the entire squad or muting nobody. And that was a feature that they added because she worked with the team and said, this is important to me. I thought that was awesome. So shout out to Ammunition. That's all. Yeah, they've made a lot of really great changes. They've made some adjustments to Clash. Um, that is the operator that has a taser-lined shield that is very difficult to penetrate. Yes, I said penetrate. They've also made some changes to the way that the drones spawn when you're trying to scout out the, the enemy's position as the attacking team. So I feel like they've done a really great job of listening to the community and like pain points and things that like, we've really found challenging and barriers to enjoying the game the way we want to and honestly i applaud everything that they've been doing with these updates they've been fantastic yeah so How we're gonna play more children do andrea i gotta know oh oh no they were terrible and he kept oh. saying the whole time <laughs> gosh i'm so bad at this game man i'm so terrible at this game and he's like hey guys want to like continue as a party into the next match and i was like no no, <laughs> no. that'll be a hard pass for me junior <laughs> no junior. Also, like, why are you playing this game? But, like, where whatever. are your parents? Probably frantically trying to do a Zoom call and you oh, being online. <laughs> you're not You're not wrong. You're not you wrong. being online is fucking up the bandwidth at their house. And they're like, oh, you're so blurry. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> oh, my God. Too, Too real, real, Andrea. <laughs> Too real. <laughs> they're just like, turn on the box thingy and leave me alone. <laughs> Anyway, I love Rainbow Six. So, Re, thank yeah. you so much for, um, you know, kind of giving me the motivation to get back in. Um, I've just been feeling a little flat on some of the other PvP shooters like Destiny, even though I'm so grateful that the, the team at DCP Live finally had me on the show. If you guys missed my episode last week, uh, please do go check it out. They are a great, great group of folks over there at the Destiny Community Podcast. And I had such a fun time talking with them. But every time I log in, I just... I'm having trouble like keeping my focus. And so it's been nice to like get like a breath of fresh air in a, in a different PVP scene. Yeah. Is there anything else you want to talk about with rainbow six or should we play more and just talk about it some other time? I think we should play more and talk about it some other time. Maybe some people can tune into us playing. Yeah, no, we're going to stream. So um, I don't know when it's either going to be today, the day the podcast comes out, potentially over the weekend, but Rhi and I are going to stream some Rainbow Six. So if you guys are in and you're playing and you're caught up and you're current and you want to you know, squat up with us, um, just tweet to me at Andrea Renee or tweet to Rihanna at, at Rihanna Tweets now. Let us know and we can hopefully um, some, you know, take down some fools. Yeah. Take down these kids. Yeah. Oh, oh, really? Britt, I'm realizing we never asked, we never asked this question, this patron question, but we can ask their other question in the next segment. Cool. Uh, Steimer, you're mm. playing the game that literally everybody in my Twitter feed is playing right now. I cannot get away <laughs> from this. So I'm in this place, Steimer, where I, on one hand, want to mute Animal Crossing on Twitter so I never have to see posts about it. And then on the other hand, I'm like on the precipice of buying it. Joy, it's, yes. I mean, Joy, yes. the Twitter... <laughs> I think all of the Animal Crossing Twitter stuff is hilarious. I love it. I want more of it. Please keep making stupid content. Um, because it also, like, my island will never look like that. I know this. I know my limits in life, and that is one of them. And, I, I mean, when I'm playing Animal Crossing, I am not... I, so I try. I one day try. I was like, you know what? I'm going to do the Tarantula Island. So basically, like, one of the things you can try and do... You like not, you chop down all the trees. You like pick all the flowers. I don't know. You dump that all, all that shit on the ground. I don't fucking know. I was just trying to get spiders to spawn because they're oh. worth so much money. Oh, is that Shit's what you do? So you make good. Them spawn? It's so good. Oh my I, gosh, when it happens, it's the best thing ever. Super impatient, and I had one spider spawn and I caught it, and then I waited and I waited and I waited, and no more spiders were spawning, and I was like, fuck this, I want to go to bed. <laughs> <laughs> so I turned it off and went to sleep. But like, I, so. That's the problem is like I have a little bit of patience, but I don't have a lot. I don't have a lot, man. And so that's 
I think what you really need if you want to super min max the game, which I don't really care about doing. So it's fine for me. I'm just in there every day, picking the fruit that needs to be picked, like catching some fish. If I feel like it going around, if there's a butterfly that's worth money, I'll catch it. Like I'm just chilling and living life in animal crossing. And that's how I want to play that game. And yes, it means that my house is not very impressive, nor is my island. But you know what? It's mine, and I'll take it. Yeah, fuck yeah. No, you should see my house. I just have random shit everywhere. I have a hat (laughs) hanging on the wall. I have a clock. I have a car bed. I have a hammock. So it's like your real house. Yeah. (laughs) Pretty much. Car bed and all. (laughs) A car bed and all, like that person. Yeah. No, I would use cyber. I I would someday. So every day I go to Nook's Cranny, and I try to buy things that I think would look good in like a Resident Evil atmosphere because I want to turn my <laughs> island into a zombie infested nightmare. Yeah, that sounds Can correct. you do right. that in Animal Crossing? I think what you can, someone did create uh, Raccoon City and someone actually just created um, Link to the Past Hyrule, which is pretty amazing. But I think what I'd have to do to get all the assets I need is download them from whatever yeah. it is. Yeah. Uh, but I have like a spooky candle that I bought. I have a, what's called a homework set because it looks like scattered paper. And in Resident Evil, you see a lot of scattered paper. Oh, so, smart. Yeah. yeah. Like, Animal Crossing is really customizable, so you can make a surprising amount of shit in it. Yeah. Um, again, I'm just like, I don't, I don't care. Like I could care, but I don't care. Like, so I get, that's why I love seeing it on Twitter. I love it. Like show me your badass shit that I will never make. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So on the Monday show, Andrea said that she is thinking about getting animal crossing and thinking about playing it. And I have the, clip. I don't think you would enjoy it. So John, that's what, said. That's what John has been saying too. So John and I are never wrong. So <laughs> <laughs> he was like, he's like, you're going to hate this game. Don't waste your time. So, um, it's just been, it was a, it was a, the weekend where I decided where I was thinking about it was because I put like three different games on and nothing was really, nothing was really clicking. It was because, you know, it was a really hard weekend, you know, cause we, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. we lost, we lost ghosts and it was really hard. And so I was like, I need something that's like Brittany says is like the, the chicken soup for the soul kind of game. I need like a comfort food game. I need something that's not stressful, like doom and not like super brain power intensive, like going through my vault and destiny. And I just, I needed something that was easy and cutesy and was like, something I could just kind of mindlessly do. So I was like, everybody's talking about Animal Crossing. Maybe and this, maybe this is the time. Maybe I just give in and just do it and just maybe make my character look cute because we had Anthony Carboni come, come by last week and he and I were streaming his island in Animal Crossing and we went to go visit our friend Amarise and her island is phenomenal. Like, oh it's, yeah, it's the best island I've literally ever seen. And I feel like I've seen everybody's island in my Twitter feed all day long. And so I was like, gosh, I really do like customization in games. And that's literally like Animal Crossing. The game is just customizing everything. So I was like, maybe it's the time. And then I've brought it up again. And John's like, no, like he's like, listen, I'm not going to stop you. If you want to buy this game, buy it. And, you know, have some fun because uh, the code that Nintendo provided me, I gave to Rihanna because I was like, listen, I'm never going to play this game. Rihanna, you should play and, and, and live your best Animal Crossing life. So thank you again to Nintendo for providing codes. But then I was like, I don't mind buying it. But then he's like, you're, gonna, you're just going you're gonna to play it for like a couple of hours and you're going to hate it. So I haven't yet. So I'm on the I'm on the fence. Still. I mean, why don't you just play John's for like a couple of hours? And then if you like it, you can buy it. Yeah, but then I had to play as John's character. Well, here's the thing. I think you would like it because <laughs> Animal go. Crossing is very similar to a Harvest Moon or a Stardew. But she doesn't where, like, like those games. I don't like those but games. But you choose your own end game, right? Like your end game could be the best outfits or the coolest cross beaded breeded flowers or the you know like the dopest island layout when you terraform things. Like you can choose your own win condition in Animal Crossing, and that's kind of what makes it magical that's interesting that you say that because Brittany was talking about how there's no real like point like in not to like be reductive but like the idea of most video games have like a beginning middle and an end right they're like you have an objective and then you beat the game you roll the credits and you're done like what is the like roll credits moment in animal crossing your best outfit 
I'm just laughing because you're. I'm laughing because Maverick mad. is in the back. Oh, he is. He's just. Oh, he's, he's just been walking oh. around here for a few minutes now. I had. <laughs> I had Straight to. Chill him. He's like he's you know he's real sad right now, so he yeah. he needs a little extra attention. Oh, so. and look how yeah. poor he is. What a good boy he he's is. He's officially so on a diet now, though. Oh, baby no. boy. Yes. Oh, it's okay. I still give him lots of treats when I see him in, like, yes. September. <laughs> I'll, just reduce, I'll just reduce his dry food when you come by so you can give him more treats. Perfect. But, yeah, I think, you know, the fact that you're still talking about it a few days later, I think you should at least try it so you know if it's not for you. You can say definitively, it is not for me. And then you can, you know, stop talking about it. And you can move on and use your brain power toward other things in life, like destiny and Rainbow Six and the division. And I don't know. Yeah, what the else. division's so good right now, too. We haven't even talked time. about that. But um, so, Steimer, I, I'm curious before we wrap up this conversation about uh, Animal Crossing. Do you have what, you know, kind of basing this off what Rihanna's talking about, like what your personal end game is? What would be Steimer's like Animal Crossing end game? Oh, I don't even have one. I like she's correct in that you can choose your own or you can just choose to not have one also is another acceptable option. And I really just log into it every day and wander around and see what's going on. And then I log it. Like sometimes I'm on for five minutes and sometimes I'm on for five hours. Like it's one or the other <laughs> with this game. And I, I like that sort of freedom and I actually need to log in tonight and get my, my nook miles. That's what I go up for every, every day. Same. I get my, Check get my nook ABD. miles, get the ABD <laughs> and then I move on. I think the one thing I might be, in, I might like want to kick some ugly neighbors out and like get the cutest neighbors I can. I've that heard about people harassing their neighbors, their neighbors really to get them That's to totally move. Fair. Mm-hmm. yeah so my first neighbor i'm fine with she's a squirrel and i think it's hilarious because i call people squirrels all the time and so i was like hey animal crossing well played cool got this really cute little squirrel neat second one is a hen she's okay i don't know about her she may need to go <laughs> and then <laughs> the third i have actually oh i really kind of want to log out and see who it is the third one's moving in today i don't know who i don't know who it's gonna be so we'll We'll take a gander oh. later and I'll, I'll let, I'll keep you posted, but I'm not going to be one of those people. Although I do think I find it hilarious. The Twitter things are like people hitting their residents, like with the net over and over again, trying to get them to leave. <laughs> oh, you can do that. No. So apparently the only way to get them to go away is to not talk to them for a week. And then I think they ask or something at, like, do you oh, want me to just go? Sad. And you're like, yeah, get the fuck out. Oh wow, you just that's ghost too them. Real. You that's ghost like them until so they're like, harsh. "Do you not like me?" <laughs> that's like totally harsh. I mean, is it though? Because people ghost me for longer than a week, and then they pop Way back later, time. and they're like, "Hey, oh, that's not good." And then you're like, "Lol, no." <laughs> I have that one bear. I'm trying to look up through my Twitter account so I can find the name of her. Oh, Paula. And what's terrifying about Paula? Wait, it's is a bear when- named Paula. It's a bear named Paula, yes. Animal Crossing, and, everybody. And when I play, I typically, I log in at night, like, as I'm laying in bed. And the silhouette of her and, like, the brief, like, little light you get off of her, she looks like Freddy Fosbear from Five Nights at Freddy's. <laughs> That's <And> terrifying. <laughs> I, I saved a clip of it because it legit but, freaked me out. But you love scary shit at night. I don't love Freddy. No. <laughs> what? You're picking and choosing now? Oh, absolutely. Fuck that. I don't play that game. That The animatronic bear can go fuck off. Sorry, that's a lot of F-bombs. Uh, I just don't like him. But, bear for children. But this is a game for, for children. children. Or a show for children. Now, is it true if you don't log into your island after a certain amount of time, like, all the weeds grow back and people leave? I don't I know if so. they leave. They mm-hmm. might be. It might be the thing where you log on and then they are like, hey, what the fuck? I yeah, think they're just disgruntled and they're unhappy. I think, but I don't think... They automatically are all gone. I do think the weeds grow back. That would make sense. Yeah, it makes sense. I, I was thinking about logging into my new leaf save, but it's been two years. And so I'm kind of, I'm <laughs> it's going to be a trash fire over that there. Don't below. go. <laughs> yeah, don't, don't go there. Uh, leave that alone. All right. Should we move along to Tiger King land? Yes. Oh, God. So um, we are going to take one more quick break so I can go dump this cat with his dad. 
Um, <laughs> when we come back, we're going to talk about what we've been watching because a lot of us have been watching a lot of things. And let's be clear, I think I just need a place to talk about Tiger King. Uh, <laughs> stick with us, everybody. We'll be right back. Welcome back, everybody. This is the final segment of the What's Good Games podcast. And listen, I just want to let you know, sometimes when we're on breaks, we do things like try to attempt to make fart sounds with our hands. And it's amusing. Just, just as an FYI. Steimer, of course, sat in judgment, as she does. But sometimes I, I participate <laughs> and sometimes I don't. It all depends on the day. It's true. I it's true. I thought I was making a farting sound. And then Andrea <laughs> Renee had a very, very vulgar description of what she thought my hand fart sounded like. It sounded Which like something Which we won't say else. because this is a podcast for children. <laughs> right. We are a podcast for children. <laughs> Allegedly. It sounded like the slap of epidermis. Yes. Yes, it did. <laughs> that slaps. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's it. <laughs> uh, so we decided to use this week's third segment to talk about what we've been watching. So a long time ago, we decided to add a what are you watching channel in the Discord. By the way, if you didn't know that What's Good Games has a Discord, discord.gg slash what's good games. There's a whole channel there for people to talk about stuff. And in fact, I believe we have a Netflix specific channel um, because there's so much great content to watch. And because a lot of us, in fact, most of the country here in the United States, I think the last stat I saw was like four out of five Americans are in quarantine or mandated quarantine right now. It means that because we're not going out to see each other, we got time to watch stuff. And boy, oh boy, are there some good things to watch. And by good, I mean crazy. And by crazy, I mean your mind is not ready for just how wackadoo this show is. And I, of course, am referring to the one and only Tiger King on Netflix. So I think what we want to do is make a decision in this moment. Do we want to make this a Tiger King spoiler conversation or do we want to make this a spoiler free conversation? I'm down for the spoilers because uh, I, mean, I have yeah. no intention of watching this whatsoever. So y'all can just teach me all about the Tiger King. Either, I think we way. should just roll with the spoilers because it's uh, it's going to be hard to talk about it without it because it's just so fucking weird. Okay. The bus is open pretty early. Yeah, so let's then just make the spoiler tag right now. If you guys are listening or watching and you don't want to know about what happens in Tiger King because you're like, I've heard about it and I want to watch it on my own, you have been fairly warned that this conversation will contain spoilers for Tiger King. Okay, so what is Tiger King, you may be asking. Rihanna I am asking legitimately that. I got my whiskey ready. Lay it on <laughs> Rihanna, how would you describe what Tiger King is? I would say Tiger King is a very interesting docu-series that explores um, private zoos, murder mysteries, some political intrigue, some cultish m m activities. And um, honestly, it's up to you to decide who the good guys and the bad guys are. But pretty much everybody's a bad guy. I was about to say, yeah, spoilers, they're all bad. <laughs> So does this follow a whole bunch of different stories or is it one story? Okay. It's, so so it started originally when this guy was making the docuseries as one story on um, the tiger, the main Tiger King. So that uh, guy is Eric Good, who is the, um, like the filmmaker of the series. Okay. Yes. Why am oh, I blanking I on the Tiger King's actual name? Joe Exotic. Joe Exotic. Joe Exotic. I don't know how it might, like, am I picturing him perfectly? But my brain was just like, nope, it's gone. We've so expunged the it. the guy with the blonde mullet and the, the eyebrow, the eyebrow ring, ring that's hanging that's on for dear life. Space. <laughs> Joe Exotic. Okay, so who's Joe Exotic? So he was one of the original private zoo men in America. Him and Doc Antle, I believe, were probably two of the first. Um, and so the story was originally just about him and his zoo. In Oklahoma? I yes. I believe it's Oklahoma. Yeah. Joe Exotic yeah. Zoo is in Oklahoma. Correct. And he... But then as he, like, started to do this series, it just went down some weird-ass rabbit holes, and he follows... So then he started adding in storylines about other people, oh. and it just started to branch out and become... sort. It, like, went beyond Joe, and it's now about, like, Carol. 
for a feral fucking Baskin. Yeah. Baskin. So Brittany, just to kind of like set the set the stage for you. So the series starts uh, with a look behind the scenes at private big cat ownership in the United States specifically. So this idea of owning exotic animals in general is a little bit taboo. And in a lot of states, it's illegal, right? There's a lot of restrictions about what types of animals you can keep as pets in your home for variety of great reasons. Um, but there's a lot of states that don't have specific legislation and there's no federal legisla- legislation that governs if you can keep tigers specifically as private pets. Um, one of the statistics that the docuseries on Netflix threw out at the end in the credits was that there are an estimated five to 10,000 privately owned tigers just in the United States. And that in the wild, conservation conservationists are estimating there's only about 4,000 wild tigers left, which is a kind of mind-bending statistic to wrap your head around that there are more than potentially more than double the amount of tigers in captivity in the United States than there are roaming free in the wild. So that's huh. not great, right? No. Um, and why? So, so go ahead. What's your question? Oh, no, it was just why. Like, I, yes, I'm exa- just here for the ride. Oh, Tell exactly People why. love power and they love having giant fucking pets and feeling special and being mm-hmm. like, I'm so cool. Look at my dick. Yeah, essentially, exactly. essentially like, that's what it feels like. That There's this draw. And like, I'm not here to disagree that there's not a draw to tigers. Like I've always loved tigers as an animal. I think a lot of people out there, you know, have this innate kind of magnetism around them because of kind of this like majestic nature they have, how powerful they are, how rare they are, how beautiful they are in the cat kingdom. And, you know, there's this desire amongst certain people to own them. But here's the thing. Turns out Owning a tiger is real, real difficult and also wildly expensive because they're real cute and little for about a month. And then they're not. Then they get really big really fast and become very difficult to take care of and to feed, et cetera, et cetera. So they follow this guy who I can't pronounce his 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 initial last name. He ch- legally changed his name to Joe Exotic and then literally legally changed it again to Maldonado Passage, which is a hyphenated last name of two of his husbands, of which he has multiple husbands. We'll get to that in a minute. Um, And he essentially, the documentary starts out looking at his ownership of big cats and how he has this zoo in Oklahoma, zoo in the biggest air quotes you can possibly put around it, and kind of like how he got into it and like why he houses all of these giant cats because he had like over 200 big cats in the park or whatever. And it's like, damn, I didn't know that you could keep that many tigers in one place. That's crazy. That's a lot of stakes. But yes, yeah, so that's like the basic premise. But then it goes, it goes places, Brittany. It goes places. It goes to murder. It goes to drugs. Okay. It goes to okay. polygamy. It's FBI setups. It goes like goes to some wild, wild places. So you have this Joe Exotic or mm-hmm. Joe Maldonado, whatever pass, Passage. whatever. He has two hundred cats or however many cats. He he had five husbands. No, he had so three. he so, he had three at one. Well, no, 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 he had two at one point simultaneously. One um, away. One. Yeah, that was oh my god. He didn't pass there away. So he much- killed himself. Like what? let's be but clear. Accidentally, theoretically, according to like so. Yeah. Okay. Well, Brittany's horrified, so we have to tell this part of the story now. So the biggest one one aspect of Joe Exotic he's is gay. that he he's wildly getting, gay. He's very gay, but he also sort of preyed on straight men who are drug addicts. Mm. So two of his first husbands question mark on the third that they the two first two admitted to not being gay they were they are straight but they uh married were him? kind of like addicted to meth like they were and he was joe exotic is a very powerful personality so like they, they were attracted to that then they got hooked on drugs or maybe they were before i'm not storylines are blurred but essentially keeping somebody there through it's definitely not love right not a real relationship <laughs> Um, the draw of the tigers, the draw of the drugs, boys day. One of them left and left with like the receptionist and is now married to her. Has a kid like, with her. Has a kid living, living off in the world, okay. doing whatever he wants to do. 
The other, unfortunately, was like stuck around the park a lot, played with a lot of guns. One day in the office, Travis, you're talking about. He, yes, Travis. He Maldonado was like he apparently thought it would be really thought it was a funny joke to like pull guns on people from when they were napping and like wake them up that way. So he did that to one of this Joe's campaign manager. Because spoiler alert, he runs for governor at some point. And uh, for president. And- <laughs> There is not enough fucking whiskey in the world yeah. for this. <laughs> no, there's yeah. not. That is even happening. Keep going. This is the best so drama ever. He, he pulls a gun on him while well, this guy's chilling there. And he's like, hey, Travis, not cool. Do not do that. And he goes, hey, man, it's fine. This gun is a blah, blah. I forget already what it is. It doesn't have a clip in it. It won't fire without a clip. Puts the gun to his head, fires. It goes off, kills himself. The more fucked up part is they have... It partially on camera, you see them, you don't see him, but you see the muzzle shot and you see the reaction of the dude he was talking to, who's just like, oh, shit. Like, yeah, he's just yeah like, his live see- reaction to witnessing this person taking their own life by accident. Yeah. Oh, God. It is. Yeah. This is why gun <laughs> okay. control is necessary because human beings are stupid. Okay, we so all we all are stupid. Probably everybody. on drugs when he was doing that. Just, yeah, you know. no. Well, I mean, they yeah. they go into detail in one of the later episodes about how Travis was like essentially high on marijuana almost all the time, always. And that you know when Joe originally met him, he was on meth, and that you know like he it's 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 intimated that he supplied him with drugs in order to kind of seduce him. Because here's Travis, this young twenty something from Southern California who ends up with this like older guy in Oklahoma who runs this big cat park. And it's like, how did this happen? Especially when it came out in the documentary that it was clear that Travis wasn't actually gay, that Travis was very much, you know, attracted to women and was hooking up with several of the women who worked at the park, but that for some reason he decided to marry Joe. I mean, like it's, the whole so, thing, Brittany, is just crazy. And so I, I'm looking at the, I looked up Joe Exotic's husbands on Google to kind of get an idea of how many husbands he had had. And it said it's I thought it was five, but now I'm seeing four. So four. I only know about three in the show. Only so the, three in the show. So there's but, three I mean, in the show. Yeah. So the first three, his first husband he was with for the longest. Um, that was the guy who left Joe. And, you know, went off with the one of the receptionists and they had a, a kid okay. together. Travis, mm-hmm. yep. um, dead. Third guy, Dylan, at the end of the documentary series, uh, Dylan and Joe are still together, hypothetically. But yeah. now Joe's in prison, which we'll get to in a second. Um, and then here, there's a fourth called John Hill. He spoke with... Andy Cohen, who is known for his show Andy Cohen Live, he's you know one of the heads of Bravo TV now, about his marriage with Joe and revealed that Joe had been placed apparently in COVID-19 isolation in prison, which is a new development. Oh, um, shit. Wait, how did he meet that guy? Uh, I don't know. It says the 24-year-old revealed that the two only dated for a little over two weeks, according to E! Online, before they decided to jump the gun and get married, but that he has no regrets and that the two tied the knot on December 11th, 2017, when he was only 22. Uh, That's we're- the other thing. They're all they're all so young when he marries them. It's so just like, young. it feels so predatory. It's oh, yeah. Yeah, terrible. So, so let me read the quote here from, from this guy, John, from this interview. So Andy asks, were the animals part of the allure in being with Joe? It seems like a lot of people got swept away by the idea of petting the baby tigers and stuff. Uh, uh, So Dylan answered. Oh, wait, Dylan. Dylan. Oh, this is Dylan Passage, though. This isn't John Hill. Oh, his third husband. So Dylan's yeah. Dylan said, uh, oh, 100 percent. I mean, I was in a really bad place when I met Joe. I was just going through a lot of things. I was an addict. Being around the animals gave me a purpose. It felt like I was actually doing something with my life. It brought me out of my depression. It was like my own little rehab. Joe never once encouraged me to do any drugs. I mean, I smoked a lot of weed, but that's literally it. During the interview, Andy also asked Dylan if he's still in touch with John Finlay or any of his other of Joe's exes. Wait, who's John Finlay? Is this like I a don't know. fifth person? He's like, yeah, with John, he was always at the park. It was kind of frustrating. He acted like he was entitled to a lot of things, blah, 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 blah. Um, 
I don't even know John who this Finlay is. But John Finley was not exotic's ex-husband. Wait, was Finley the he the guy like, who ran off? I'm the first husband. With the, love. Yeah, John what is the tattoos? first husband. He's oh like, yeah, so that was the first husband. Sorry. There's too Ooh. many. It's hard to keep track of everybody. Yeah. Five, <laughs> five of them. Okay. Wow. Okay. So, okay. So this is like the, what I have. So you have this dude. He has like five husbands at one point. I Drugs are really, a thing. Yeah. So, where and why like what what happens like is it just the documentary just following all of them his oh, life but but Brittany you're missing the whole Carol Baskin and his rival and then also the person who tries to steal his zoo from him so and no, then so also oh sorry I, I just want to come back to the husbands because we're getting it a little wrong the first and this is very important apparently Joe's first husband was Brian Ryan who he met in the 1980s ah that's there it is husband, that's husband number one he was not on Tiger King okay. he apparently died from complications of HIV in 2001 oh tragic sucks um, so that's that's, the mystery so that's where that's, that's where the other husband came from okay got it got it okay okay okay, okay so you got Dude and drugs and husbands and tigers. And then you have Carol Baskin. Okay. Yes, Carol Baskin. Rihanna, tell the Carol Baskin story. Carol Baskin is in charge of a wildlife preserve that tries to rescue tigers that are kept in captivity. Called Big Cat Rescue. Called Big Cat Rescue. Carol Baskin has a huge social media presence and she likes to post videos and blogs Saying like, "What's up, all you cats? Hey, all you cool, cool cats, cats and kittens. kittens!" Is Carol cool? Is she a good guy? Like, good girl? There are no, no good girls no. Oh, oh. in the story. No one is good. Everyone's bad. Carol Baskin uh, may have killed her first husband and fed him to oh her cat. Oh my fuck! What the fuck? Okay. Allegedly. 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 And honestly, even if she didn't. <laughs> She's still not the world. Yeah. So, person. Brittany, what's interesting about the way that this documentarian put this together, and for the record, I do not like the style of this. I do not like this man. I don't like. The more you dig into him, the more it's like it gets shadier and shadier. And like, God. I, I, like, it was off-putting. So when we call this a documentary series, like, keep in mind that every documentary is through the lens of the person who's making it. And that is very apparent with Tiger King. Um, So Carol Baskin, they do a whole backstory on her, but they don't really do it into what episode three. So they kind of set her up as like a good guy in the first episode or two. And then they dive deep into her very insidious backstory where she, you know, has this personality on social media, as Rihanna said, as being, a conservationist but then you realize that she started out actually in like the cat um the big cat trade and big cat breeding just like all of the other people that she is going up against did and it's like wait a minute are you just like conveniently not telling people that you had this like nefarious part of your history or are you like apologizing for it and you're trying to do better or like did you actually you know, are you a better person? And the answer is like, no, no one, no one's the good guy in this scenario. Oh, boy. I think my favorite part though was the, the when they did the pivot on Carol, it was very clear like they didn't really know from the beginning. So like the way that they transitioned into that was somebody casually saying it, like yeah, they're because they're interviewing somebody and they're like, I don't know when you're her and her husband just like disappeared, blah blah blah, and he was like, wait, what? What do you, what do you mean? Yeah. And they're like, oh. yeah, her. Her first husband just no one ever found him. No one ever. And they found were like him. cold case. What? Just a cold case. Just, he's fucking gone. And he was the millionaire, right? He was the one who had the money, which is what they were using to even start the cat breeding in the first place. Then obviously they continued to make money from that as a business. Like it's uh-huh. it's mm. really messed up. There's a lot of twists here. <laughs> There's um, so a that's, twist that's, almost that's every more, episode. <laughs> yeah, no, because then at some point, so uh, there's Carol. And so now she is whatever, quote unquote, turned a new leaf. Her whole thing is the cat rescue. And Joe and her are like mortal enemies in this sense. Because Joe, she wants to help pass legislation that would basically shut his zoo down, right? Or shut all of the zoos down. But not the, the private ones, rather. So you're led to believe she has turned a new leaf. Yes. Sure. Yeah. You're led to believe, yes. And who's to say whether or not that's true? That's not really the point of the story. Mm. Um, 
But what it dives into is how Joe antagonizes her and Joe constantly is talking about killing her and is putting that on live streams. And the funnier part to me was how much it shows how messed up our toleration of online behavior is and how much you have to do in order to be taken as a credible threat to someone's life or someone's safety because he was going on video streams and pointing guns at mannequins and shoot shooting them being like that's carol and that's what we're going to do to carol and putting or like here's this jar and i'm going to put her head in this jar and everyone was just like yeah but he's crazy so don't worry about it and he made an entire music video (laughs) about her how long ago was that like like a year or two ago Oh, okay. So it's recent. Really? I thought it was more than that, but I'm not. I can't. I don't actually. Oh, I thought it was like 2017 or 2018 when he got sentenced. Mm -hmm. Sentenced. So that would mean the stuff he was doing was before that. Oh, you mean when he when his feud with Carol started? Oh, oh, oh. I don't. I don't. I can't remember how far back the feud began. But it's like old. Like you can tell the grainy, shitty quality of like (laughs) original internet video. (laughs) Yeah. So essentially, like their feud footage against her. Yeah, sure. yeah. Jeez. So their feud, Brittany, kind of stemmed from this idea that she went after him because her th- whole thing is like, I'm all about conservationists and I'm trying to protect these cats. And I bring these big cats in when people, you know, buy a baby tiger because they think it's cool to have a baby tiger. And then they realize within a couple of weeks, oh, shit, I have a baby tiger that's no longer a baby anymore. What am I going to do with this? And then they want to dump it. And they're like, well, t- her her big cat rescue will take these tigers and give them a home. And it's like, that sounds on its face like a good thing, right? It's like, oh, that sounds great. But maybe like, why don't you work with like an animal conservationist program that will actually put them back into the wild, though? Because it feels like tigers shouldn't be in a park in Florida where big cat rescue is. It should be a bunch of free volunteers. Yeah. It's like outside of Tampa. It's like, it feels like tigers should be back in like their natural habitat, which isn't Florida spoilers. It's like India or Africa or a variety of other places that aren't on North American continents because tigers aren't from here. (laughs) Um, And so there's like, it's, it's tough because as I mentioned, like all of the framing of Carol Baskin is done through the lens of the, the person who made this series. And I don't know Carol Baskin. I've never met her. <laughs> but based off what we've seen just on Tiger King, seems like maybe she's not as good of a person as she pretends to be on the internet. That said, she's definitely, in my opinion, the least. The worst the, of the evils? Yes. The least of the evils. Oh, yes. The, uh, the, the best. The best of the yeah, evils. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, out of all the people, because... I don't necessarily agree or whatever with what she's doing. I don't necessarily disagree with it either. I just think she seems like kind of a shit person. Yeah. <laughs> um, but there's a I lot of there's a there's, lot of shit people. You got so sex many, cult like, leaders so and many con really, men. Like, yeah, there's so many other worse people that you're just like, well, okay, <laughs> you mm. kind of get a, a little bit of a pass. Yeah. Um, so you got Joe and Carol. Joe and Carol, oh, uh, and then baby girl, there's even more. There's so a lot more. So you got the weird, the weird Doc Ansel who I was talking about before. He's just, he's a very side branch. He can be a brief one. Uh, he essentially is creepo master number twelve, and sex he, cult leader. Sex cult leader. He'll like. Oh my god. He, he does the same thing that Joe does, but with girls, basically. Uh, and he's and, got the and he's got the tigers, and he's got the whole. Ho- okay, can I? Steimer, I have to interrupt you for a second. I, I had a, I had a, an argument with John when we first started watching Tiger King because, in like the second episode, the the director really kind of pivots to framing Doc in a very negative way, and I was like, I was like, why is he doing this? It feels like it's unfair. Like, uh, like this guy just like hasn't done anything to deserve this. And John's like, no sure he's gonna turn out to be like an evil bad guy (laughs) and i was like yeah but like he's on the tonight show so doc antle is this guy who has been in animal handling and exotic animal handling in hollywood for a really long time and so he's got this like really long list of all of these shows that he's brought animals on because we've all seen those segments on tv where they have the person who brings out the the weird animal and they used to be jack Hanna. 
Exactly. Yeah, well, I mean, it used to be good guys like Steve Irwin, you know, and like thankfully Bindi has taken up her dad's mantle and is doing a lot of that now, which I think is awesome. But like there are also like bad dudes like Doc Antle who are doing it because like the exotic animal business is a relatively small community where all of these people know each other. And clearly when Hollywood is going to book like an exotic animal to work on a film shoot, there's only like probably uh, X amount of people who you go to to book that. And apparently Doc Antle is one of those guys. Uh, after this, I don't think Doc Antle's ever going to work in Hollywood again. Um <laughs> And so at the, at the beginning, I was like, why are they making this guy seem so bad? I was like, he, he didn't convince these women. You know, he's not holding these women against their will. They're just like wanting to have all the cute cats. And they see that he works in Hollywood. And they're just being like typical like clinger ons. And then like each passing episode, I had to eat a little bit more crow. I was like, God damn it. He's the worst. Why is everybody in this show the goddamn worst? I don't get it. Yeah, oh, the oh. worst part about Doc, in my opinion, is not the, the weird sex cult. It's the thing where he's basically accused of once tigers are oh. past the cute age of like being able to be in petting parties, essentially, he just shoots them and buries them. Yeah, he euthanizes yeah. these babies. That and paying his employees $400 a month. That's better than Carol Baskins, who pays them literally nothing. She's like, yeah. these bitches are dumb enough to volunteer, so everyone's a volunteer. It's just all bad. Yeah. All like, of it is all the bad. Biggest garbage fire I've it, like. I know you. Can't you haven't even gotten up. to Jeff Lowe yet. What the fuck? <laughs> is that his name? I think that's yes, his name. Yes, that's, that's Jeff Lowe. Okay. Can't yeah. lay it, I mean, I can't. Nothing can possibly surprise me at this point. So lay it on me. So Jeff Lowe comes into the picture because. Joe Exotic does some stupid shit. Carol Baskin starts to sue him for it because she can. Because he basically takes her name, her copyright name, and is like, now we're Big Cat Productions and we're, this is what we make for our reality show. And they're like, uh, no, that's not how that works. And she obviously has a lot of money. So Joe, not so much. She runs him through legal courts basically over and over again until he has no more financial... Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Assets. Resources? Assets. Yeah, yeah. The things he's, that the government done, like possesses when you when you lose a lawsuit, liquidity. the government is like, yo, we uh, well, not the government, really. I mean, that's more that's a different thing. But like the lawyers will do like a laundry list, like an inventory of everything you have that's of of value because you lost the lawsuit. And then like then the government enforces paying the lawsuit back. And so the lawyers will then make a list of everything you own that's worth value. And they took literally everything from Joe Exotic that had any value whatsoever. And like the the series documents this and they show them like, oh, he took this, he took this, he took this. It's like, yeah, no, it's because he he broke the law and he did a thing he wasn't supposed to do. And instead of like negotiating with them, he tried to fight it, even though he knew that he was wrong. And yeah. just did some and light then, arson. And it's just, like, so... Destroying evidence. Yeah, we didn't even talk about that. Oh, oh my God. God. So he gets in all this trouble, doesn't have any more money. So what he does for a lot of his stuff is, like, he'll put everything in other people's names. So a lot of his cars or whatever were in his husband's names. So that that's, that they so they couldn't do exactly what Andrew was saying, right, for a lot of stuff. They can't repossess anything. They, you can't repossess anything if it's not yours. So one of the things he did, he met this guy, Jeff Lowe, um, who is turns out to spoiler alert be a con man but at the beginning he thinks is this really great guy he's really rich he's got this hot wife whatever they party in vegas all the time these are great Seems people legit. they're going to help me they want to help the zoo and they're what i'm going to do is i'm going to put the zoo in jeff's name because that way carol baskin cannot get it be oh. so jeff takes the zoo and then takes, takes the zoo, the zoo. <laughs> and brings in his own management to this place. Oh, we didn't even talk about the girl who got her arm eaten, but whatever. What that could the fuck? <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, oh, or the guy that has no legs, and for the longest time you wonder, did a tiger eat his legs? And he's like, oh, no, I lost my legs in a zip lining accident. <laughs> yeah. He, he was he was not tiger related. He just yeah he's just no. chilling. He's straight chilling. Um, <laughs> but yeah no so I, this one of the that was fucked up too. Oh god. But Brittany, we can forget th about this her. whole show is like the biggest dumpster fire you've ever seen. <laughs> I, I it really like, is. 
you can't make this shit up. But again, like this just this sounds like one fucking monstrosity after the other. Okay, so now Joe is putting things in everyone else's name. He puts it in Jeff's name. Jeff puts literally Jeff takes name. over the zoo. Yes, and he then he basically steals the zoo from him. Okay. And as he's going along, Jeff gets in trouble for a couple of other things. Having el- tigers illegally in Vegas is one of them. They put baby tigers in rollerboard suitcases so that they could bring them up to people's hotel rooms sneakily so that they wouldn't get caught because, yo, that's not legal. So that way people would pay him to bring tigers to Vegas suite parties and then they would bring these baby tigers and people would then pet the baby tigers and pass them around, but they would then like put them in luggage to bring them upstairs. Oh, my God. Yeah. Yeah, the animal cruelty is unreal. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely a giant trigger for... I mean, and, like, I am glad that they didn't show, like, some of the more egregious things that were talked about but never shown about some of the animal cruelty, particularly, like, them... Like, there was a moment where I thought they were going to show Joe Exotic shooting a tiger in the face. Yeah. And, like, it's it's crazy because, like, this is all cast against the idea of owning private tigers in the United States like the idea of like having a tiger as a pet like these people are like we have a zoo but it's like you don't really have a zoo you have like a glorified park with a bunch of fences and it does feel like at least some of the people on staff at these places actually cared about the well-being of the animals and actually were trying to do the right thing they just didn't have the funds to do it properly like a big part of the storyline with Joe Exotic Zoo was that he didn't have the money to feed the tigers because, like, when you have 200 tigers, it's, like, tens of thousands, a lot of not meat. hundreds of thousands of dollars a year worth of meat because tigers eat raw protein. Like, cats are supposed to eat just raw protein. And so you, they were getting offloaded meat from Walmarts to feed their animals because they Expired. did this. Expired. Expired. And they simply couldn't sell to humans anymore. They would get that, and then oh. and the sadder part is that the humans would take it too. They'd be like, because a lot of people who worked there were very poor. And then so, at one point, they were using it to make pizzas for his pizzeria. Also true. Wait, I totally missed that part. Yeah. So at some point, to try and make the park more lucrative, they added a pizzeria, oh. and they definitely used the meat from the expired trucks on those pizzas. Holy shit. Honestly, I don't think there is an episode of any podcast that would be long enough to go into the depths that this <laughs> documentary reaches. <laughs> There's so much. Okay, well, we're, let, we have to take, we have to finish this journey for Brittany because it's yes. not over yet. Baby yes. girl, you can't leave me hanging. You can't leave me hanging. So I'm trying to remember the exact timelines. It gets a little blurry, honestly, the way that they juggle timelines. So but Jeff has the zoo. Jeff has the point. zoo. And at some point along the way, while he has the zoo, the, um, what is the name of the bureau? It's like the Fish and Wildlife or something, or they're oh. basically the FBI, but for animal. Yeah, so there's a case. separate government entity that manages, um, that manages exotic animal stuff. Let me look it up. Something. Yeah. Okay, so the, there's the organization. So there's so the government is like, hey, we are hearing some rumblings of some weird shit going on around. I think originally it was actually probably about Jeff Lowe. So what Jeff Lowe started to do, this is all insinuated. Is it the U.S. Course. Fish and Wildlife Service? Yes. That That's one. Right. Yeah. Because it sounds really benign and you're like, whatever, what could they do? But no, they're actually. <laughs> they're... Actually, on Google, it says, what does the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service do? They protect wildlife resources through effective enforcement of federal laws. We assist with efforts to un- recover endangered species conserve migratory birds preserve wildlife habitat safeguard fisheries combat invasive species and promote international wildlife conservation okay yep all right so that's so they what they start do investigating jeff so they start investigating jeff we think um because what happens in the part that they actually what actually happens is jeff very cleverly starts pushing joe exotic more on the carol baskin front Starts being like, hey, don't you want to kill this bitch? Whatever, like, gets him to uh, say things on camera that will make that are very incriminating. Um, and at some point, he, like, at some point, Joe hires Alan, who is Jeff's right-hand man, or at least it says okay. that this is what's happening, to go to Florida and kill her. And mm-hmm. theoretic- theoretically gives her 
gives him three thousand, gives Alan three thousand dollars to go do it. Says, "Here's three thousand dollars. Get your ass to Florida." I thought that sounded cheap, where... cheap for murder. Oh, that's <laughs> pretty cheap. Really? Like, yeah. Wow. I was like, There's no way anybody would do that. First of all, you'd have to be really fucking dumb. But that aside, <laughs> they're they're all pretty dumb on the show. <laughs> okay, so so, someone, so Jeff's one of Jeff's right hand man has been hired by Joe to go kill Carol. Yes. yes. This is what it has Got been it. set up as. So who knows if it was actually real, if Jeff's really good at setting it up, who can okay. say? Um, but so that is what then the Eye of Sauron moves to. <laughs> and they start collecting more and more evidence. They start uh, wiring people to go talk to Joe or whatever, getting more and more evidence on this thing. That's when the arson. Well, no, there was multiple arsons, weren't there? Shit. There were two. Yeah. There's two arsons. Oh, my God. Oh. So I think what Steimer's trying to communicate is that the feds here know that there's a lot of bad shit happening and they're trying to figure out what's the easiest charge that we could bring against this guy so that we can then bring all of the other like smaller charges. And so that's why they're trying to collect evidence against this murder for hire hit because clearly that'll have the longest sentence if they can convict against that. But that was actually crazily the flimsiest charge of like the what 20 charges they brought against Joe yeah, Exotic. I think 19. Yeah. Um, be- oh. Because they didn't have enough evidence because clearly everybody who's a witness is fucking not believable. <laughs> oh my God. Like, yeah. This is, this is someone's life. Like it's just, no, it's just crazy that people live this way. Some people mm-hmm. live this way. Like this is wow. Well, okay. Anyway. So now they're looking, they're investigating they investigated Joe. Okay. They arrested Joe. Well, Joe also took off, right? At like, yeah. so he's yeah. scared. He got spooked because he, he knew that shit was going down. He got okay. spooked. He moved with his new baby husband, Dylan, to some other place in Oklahoma, thinking he could, I don't know, outrun the feds. And then stupidly continued to post on social media. They moved to Florida. He kept tagging everything as Belize. Bitch, you're not in Belize. Also, can we for a second talk about the fact that he tagged hashtag Belize, hashtag Mexico? Oh, no. As if Mexico and Belize are the same place? Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay, well, mm-hmm. Yeah, so, you know, not the brightest bulb. The brightest hair, possibly. Huh. It's very bleached. Oh, hair is very bright. <laughs> So then, yeah, so the feds catch him in, in Florida because not Belize. clearly he didn't in go Mexico. to Belize or Mexico. <laughs> Neither of those two places did he go. Uh, and he he gets convicted. Like, they, they charged him with 19 counts of all sorts of shit, going from something small like selling baby tigers to, like, hey, trying to murder a woman. <laughs> a plot to commit murder. <laughs> a plot to commit murder i think the funnier part to me is yeah looking at him you're like this man is not smart enough to do any of this well not well obviously the the tiger shit sure uh because another thing oh the other party they got him for was like euthanizing four tigers because they saw they found skeletons of four tigers in the backyard of the office or something um although like two is he had a this sounds terrible but like a somewhat decent point of like sometimes an animal gets sick or whatever and like you have to put them down. I'm like, well, you don't usually shoot them in the head, but okay. If you're in Oklahoma and you're poor, maybe that is what you do. I don't know. I but- like it's like, it was a little raw for me as somebody who just like went through a euthanasia thing sure. with my own yeah, my own first. cat and as a cat mom. And it was like it was weird because at first John was like, "Do you want to watch this right now?" And I was like, "No, like this is absurd. This is like not real life." But then it apparently it was all real. Um, but I think like the idea of uh, that, that Joe was trying to make not to fucking defend Joe Exotic, um, <laughs> but apparently I'm defending Joe Exotic. That's but how like I felt five seconds ago, so the amount fine. of the amount of drugs or chemicals that would require to properly euthanize a tiger, which zoos sometimes have to do, um, was probably way more expensive than he could pay for if he was looking at murdering somebody for $3,000. And this is a guy who like carried a gun at his hip and literally every shot that they had of him, like he always had a gun on him. The, The gun culture of this show is not to be understated. Like they, guns are everywhere pink camo guns, skinned guns, people just randomly shooting guns. And in like the last episode, there's these moments where Joe's just like 
trying to be funny, like shooting guns at like the feet of people in the park and they like run away like, ah, ha, ha. And I was like, motherfucker, if you shot a gun, like a real fucking gun at my feet as a joke, it would be over for you. I would be bringing charges against you. But apparently people who like guns in Oklahoma think that that's just a funny pastime joke. And I was just like, whoa. So in that mindset, it's believable that in Joe's mind, he was just euthanizing an animal with a gun when in the minds of the authorities, he was doing it in a much more nefarious way. And who's right? Man, who the could only, say? <laughs> again, not to defend Joe Exotic. The only thing for this point where I was like, this seems like a weak, a really weak case is that there were only four of them. I'm like, if he was regularly just out there shooting tigers and you have 200 on your property, you found four, like mathematically there would be more if he was some crazy, like tiger Tiger-man. murderer. Well, and right? I, like, if- like, again, <laughs> for the third time now, not to defend Joe Exotic, <laughs> of all the, <laughs> Of all the wackadoos on this fucking TV show, it did feel like Joe, of all the men specifically, like putting Carol Baskin aside because she's her own special kind of crazy. um, Mm. It did feel like Joe was the guy who actually like cared about the cats and wanted to keep the cats alive and form these friendships and relationships with them. It felt like Jeff Lowe was clearly just using them for pussy, for lack of a better word. Um, yeah. and both, pun intended. Both, both, both the pun. Of the Him word. and Doc Antle. It felt like both of those men were using the big cats as power plays to get women. Mm-hmm. And Doc Antle is very specifically. But Jeff Lowe, the same way. It, I've, And I don't want to like make a weird correlation or any kind of overarching judgments about the differences between the fact that Jeff and Doc were heterosexual versus, you know, Joe being homosexual. But it didn't seem like Joe was using the tigers to get like hordes and hordes of men. But it did seem uh, like both he Jeff- got three husbands out of it. What are you talking about? It well, seemed like uh, Joe like desperately the- just wanted a husband and just kept acquiring more. Doc and Jeff. Felt like different. they felt like they were just down to have fuck parties all the time. They yeah. didn't want to marry any of these women. They didn't want long term relationships. They didn't want to keep them around. With the, well, with the exception of Jeff and like Lauren, right? They ended up having a kid together. But like, it felt Ooh, like that was a rough conversation <sighs> to watch. Oh my goodness! Oh my god! When he was talking about how he needs his nanny to be hot, and then yeah. he was like, "I can't wait to start losing weight after you give birth." I was like, "You motherfucking asshole yeah. of a human!" He was being. like, "She's got to hit the gym as soon as this thing comes out." I was like, "Wow! Wow! Um, okay. Wow! So why are you in this relationship?" So have we covered how we've covered he- the major plot points? <laughs> Okay, so at the end, he gets arrested. At the end, he's in jail, and he talks about... And he's still, uh, right, in jail? Yeah, so they find him guilty. He's serving currently a 22-year sentence. So I I pulled up the story here from justice.gov. Joe Exotic, (laughs) convicted of murder for hire and violating both the Lacey Act and the Endangered Species Act. So it says that um, on September 5th, 2018... A federal grand jury returned an indictment that accused Maldonado Passage of a hiring an unnamed person in November of 2017. So this wasn't that long ago <laughs> to murder Jane Doe in Florida. Also hiring a person who turned out to be an undercover FBI agent to commit that murder. That's a wrinkle we didn't talk about. We'll just leave that for another time. Superseding indictment handed down on November 7th, 2018, further alleged that Maldonado Passage falsified forms involving the sale of cats and sold an offer to sell tiger cubs in interstate commerce, which is illegal. Because tigers are an endangered species, these alleged killings and sales violated the Endangered Species Act. During a trial that began on March 25th, a jury heard evidence that Maldonado Passage gave Alan Grover, Alan Glover, excuse me, $3,000 to travel from Oklahoma to South Carolina and then to Florida to murder Carol Baskin with a promise to pay thousands more after the deed. Baskin, a critic of Maldonado Passage's Animal Park, owns a tiger refuge in Florida, secured a multi-million dollar judgment against Maldonado's Passage's Park, which is really why he wanted to murder her because she won the lawsuit against him. 
In addition to the murder for hire counts, the trial included evidence of violations of the Lacey Act, which makes it a crime to falsify records of wildlife transactions in interstate commerce. According to these counts, Maldonado Passage designed designated on delivery forms and certificates of veterinary inspection. The tigers, lions, and a baby lemur were being donated to the recipient or transported for exhibition only when he knew they were being sold. So that's really how they got him. Finally, the jury, the jury heard evidence that Maldonado Passage personally shot and killed five tigers in October of 2017 without a veterinarian present and in violation of the Endangered Species Act. So, ladies, we have a question from Groovy Muse. If you all get to talking about Tiger King, what's your one takeaway from the series? Personally, I thought some of the last talking points about wild animal captivity and cruelty stuck with me. Also, I could hear myself echo during half of that sentence. So if it sounded I'm weird, I'm proud sorry. of you. You sound great. For making it through that because I also have had the speech jammer happen, and it's really difficult to make it through a sentence when it does. Thanks, baby girl. Thank you. I think the whiskey. Okay, so like, what do you take away from this? As you've all seen the clusterfuck, and I have no desire to see this now. I mean, you did a great job explaining it. I've seen all I've needed to see. I think my takeaway is I hope that people who see this decide instead to donate their money to real conservationist efforts. There was somebody on my Twitter feed that's like, imagine if Jeff Lowe and Joe Exotic had instead of spending money on Joe Exotic's governor and presidential campaign runs, which we never really brought up, which was her thing, which is another indictment that he had because turns out you can't just fund your own presidential campaign. There's a lot of laws against campaign financing. He broke those too. Um, <laughs> yep, he did. Imagine the good that they could have done with these, what ended up potentially being millions of dollars that they spent over a couple of years to actually fund the preservation of tigers in their natural habitat instead of further breeding tigers under this guise of allowing people to play with them as kittens and then either not having a space for them and then putting them in cages or euthanizing them. There's this really sad moment at the end of the series where Joe finally admits that he kept these chimpanzees apart from each other in a cage for 10 years. And then when he got arrested, he, you know, kind of released them to a Florida conservation company where they got to be in a, a natural chimpanzee habitat together. And that they, they had this moment where they like hugged because they were forever like holding each other's hands, like through a cage. Cause he oh. kept them in separate cages. And the, the guy, Eric, had asked him the doc the filmmaker was like you know the do you think that you kept them apart is this your fault and he was like yeah no like I did I did I prevented them from being chimpanzees together for 10 years of their life and that at the very end is like the biggest fucking gut punch and it's like the animals are the real fucking victims here man I I agree with you on that there was also one line that I thought was very sort of poetic justice so they have phone calls with joe when he's in jail and one of the things he says is like do you know why animals die in cages it's because their soul dies first oh. and i was like and that's what's going to happen to you sir like you will probably die in jail and it will be your soul that goes first but after all that you have done because i do agree like at the beginning of his career or foray into this industry he probably had decent intentions and like was more interested in the animals. And then it just blew into like this whole narcissistic evil growth thing, like where then it becomes about you and I'm the personality and I'm the star. I'm amazing. Aren't I amazing? Tell me I'm amazing. And it becomes this twisted gross thing. And like, so now to have to have, like now he just has time to sit and think, although apparently now he is ill, but I'm not sure. But I don't know how somebody in prison gets COVID-19, but that's a discussion for another time. I guess they, yeah. were, they allowed visitors. I don't know. Before? Yeah. My takeaways would be two things. A, do your research. Like, there are a lot of celebrities that popped up in this documentary. I was 
patrons of Doc Antle and Joe Exotic, and it's honestly just really disappointing to see that they Shaq. went for oh. this exciting moment where I can hold a tiger, and they didn't really look any further into the situation to see, like, hey, this is animal abuse. I should maybe shine a light on this, or maybe not give them my money, or give them my publicity, and it's it's just disappointing. So I would say, first of all, do your research. If you're going to get involved with somebody and you have any bit of power, use it responsibly. And B, if somebody you know needs help or if you need help, get help. Joe Exotic seems like a very, very hurt person. Like there's a lot of things that happen to him that come up in the documentary that are extremely traumatizing, very damaging to anybody. And it seems as though... Joe Exotic didn't have the resources that would have possibly helped to lead him down maybe a more healthy or less damaging path for the rest of the world. And there are so many resources out there. There are so many people out there that care. There's Take This. There are different organizations that can help you get back on track if something's hurting you and it's causing you to act out against others and yourself. And if you're not feeling good or if you feel like you need some outside source to validate your existence, then that is not a good place to be. And there are people who can help you put you back on track. Amen. That was, that was very well said, Ree. Thanks. Yeah. Wow. Well, hmm. thank you, ladies, for uh, introducing me to that whole world. Uh, it was a thing. You're yeah. welcome. I it think. sounds like I still even. I yeah, right. It sounds like I still even missed about half of the craziness that went down. Some you did. Run. I think like the big like remaining question for me is, at the end of the series, Jeff Lowe was building a brand new zoo, at the edge of Oklahoma and Texas to move because he robbed <laughs> Joe Exotic of his zoo, uh, which ended up. You know, I don't want to see be, say being for the best because it's not. But like, I think that this idea that he is moving, he's shutting down the former zoo that Joe Exotic was known for and is moving all of the animals to this brand new, supposedly bigger, more luxurious, more space for the animals experience. And me going, is he though? I feel like Jeff Lowe definitely is guilty of something. And this documentary is not going to be good for him. So how are people going to go to this new thing? And but like, I mean, on the show, they kind of already highlighted, like, I think that was already falling apart. Yeah. The, the partnership between Jeff Lowe, I already forget the other guy's name. There was another guy who was also, yet again, a private zoo owner dude who is also kind of a piece of shit. I tweeted and... a gif of him earlier because I was like, who is this <laughs> random dude on the jet ski that's now just like coming in at like the 11th no, hour? No, that's a different dude. That's the other dude. There's You're another talking about the dude. Chucky dude? Yes, the Chucky dude. That's no, what I'm not talking about. Not, no, no, no. Not, not the Chucky, Chucky dude. dude. The other guy what? who had the monkeys. The monkey guy. Oh. The guy who oh, I, I had a monkey on him oh, and was yes. like driving a bulldozer and was building this zoo by himself is what it looked like in Texas or whatever, the edge of Texas. Yeah. And I was just like, I'm sorry, you're going to build this like, giant there's no zoo more, by yourself? There's no more bourbon left in this bottle to deal with the bullshit of the show. One tractor. <laughs> he had one tractor, and he was just moving dirt by himself. <laughs> and I was like, this will take you 20 years. Are you seriously <sighs> trying to do this alone? Oh, no. And then he was like, well, Jeff, did, turns out Jeff didn't have any money. I'm like, no shit, Jeff didn't have any. Jeff never had any money. Jeff is The only thing Jeff has money for is affliction shirts. That's it. Tea. <laughs> oh man oh man all right ladies and gentlemen if this has piqued your interest oh. there is no shortage of stories of all of these characters responding to the internet loving tiger king um so we encourage you to go and research because man there is like a whole nother rabbit hole of shit to fall down when it comes to tiger king Brittany, are you intrigued Do you want to go watch it now Fuck no. I just actually <laughs> heard about some zombie flick on Netflix that I'm kind of thinking about, but it will absolutely not be Tiger King. <laughs> it's Korean zombie series called Kingdom. Oh, Kingdom? Yeah. yeah. I, I saw Cliff Lazinski tweet about it. And like, that sounds like something I'd like a lot more than this bullshit that y'all just described. Pretty so. dope. Kingdom is dope. Well, yeah. I'm down to keep talking about what we're watching as long as we're all watching stuff. So, um, so watch it. 
ladies watch it and let's talk about it. So um, thank you everybody for hanging with us through this wild Tiger King conversation and the rest of the show. We know this has been a very long episode, but we know that you like the in deep conversations and like this was this was a fun one for sure. Oh boy. It went places. Memeable to say the least. We will be back on Monday at 11 a.m. Pacific time at twitch.tv slash what's good games. Then, of course, your regular Friday show will be as scheduled. And I didn't mention this earlier in the show, so I'm mentioning it at the very end. A very special guest named Jessica Chobot is finally joining us on What's Good Games. We've been trying to get her on the show for literally years. As you can imagine, she's a very busy person, but also, as you can imagine, she's not going anywhere right now. So I reached out and was like, can we finally get you on the show? And she's like, yes, let's do it. So we will have her next week. Hopefully you guys will join us for that. In the meantime, play some video games. Be good to each other. Give somebody a thank you, a hug, a moment of gratitude. It's tough right now. Spread some love in your life. See you next week, everybody. Bye.